Good evening, once again. We are so thankful for your patience. And we have been having some technical difficulties. We do have John Rosier with us now, and we will resume. Our topic, once again, is the troublesome legacy of 1844. John Rosier, we welcome you once again to share this presentation with us. Please don't mute. Mute myself. Ah, there we are. He wouldn't allow me to do that. Okay. There we are. Well, third time lucky, I suppose. Hello, everybody. Hello, John. Hello, John. Now, can everybody, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Yes. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Much Take your time and start right. from the beginning. Well, we'll start from the beginning. Yes. In 1999, sorry, in 1995, a lady called Dr. Hazel Bull called a group of us together to a place called Clavenden, which is in Warwickshire, village of Warwickshire, in order to discuss something that she thought was extremely important. First of all, she realized that there was a division inside the church, and she thought that what she needed to do was to find a way of reconciling that division. So she invited the Gaisley group down and friends of Gaisley from at least two or three churches. And she also invited a group of ministers, myself, Mervyn, and a couple of others. And so we sat there. Now the Gaisley group, for those who don't know it, is where are a group of very conservative, traditional heritage Adventists. They set up a center for the actually for, for teaching people about what they saw as true Adventism, which they thought people like me were not involved in. And, ulti and ultimately, the next problem was that they came down and they sat there and we sat there. And immediately we started to realize that the focus of their attention was on the really and truthfully, the authority that they held to. And that authority was Ellen White. Now, I did tell her that there would be a problem here, but she persisted in this, and she herself had done a great deal of work trying to get all the quotes together by Ellen White in order to try to show that we weren't very far apart from each other. Unfortunately, as the day progressed, and I must admit I got a headache as this day progressed, and the, it became very clear that the gap between us was extremely wide. And when we came to the final section of this, because she was looking at three things, she was looking at salvation, the nature of Christ and the nature of sin. And it was during the time of the nature of sin, particularly when we attempted to show them that the position that they had on sin was wholly inadequate. And we started to show them from Romans and from Psalms and from other places that these, this, that the Bible suddenly became of no consequence to them because of, it was not their authority. And the and they taken down all these quotes from Ellen White that she'd given. And by the time we came down to this particular discussion, the whole meeting suddenly realized that, in fact, we had two authorities inside this this um, event. And also this this actual meeting, when I look back on it, represented a microcosm of the tremendous schism that there is within Adventism. <laughs> well, we on one side. Could not agree with them on the other side and it didn't matter what we looked at biblically there was no way in which we could bring this them together onto our side to understand biblical texts and the result was of course that they went home believing what they believed and we went home believing what we believed and absolutely nothing was achieved 
But the thing that it did do was to show us the gap, the tremendous gap that there was between those of us who tended to be gospel orientated and those who tended to belong to um, this form of Adventism, the older form of Adventism, traditional heritage Adventism or traditional historical Adventism. And, you know, as I thought about that, that it's very sad, really, that we have come to this. But if you look very carefully at the reason for all this, it goes back for me, anyway, it goes back to the way we've looked at 1844 and what has happened. And so now up on your screen, you'll start to see presumably some things. But let us first start with the problem of 1844 from the very beginning. And so I'm going to very briefly go through exactly how Miller arrived at this particular date. Um, remember, I've already given a, a presentation on this in some detail. So this is just briefly what he did. And we find out that he arrived at his original terminus date and called time on the method. That's what he did. He used the failed year day principle, which had been applied to dates right the way back to the sort of eighth, the ninth century at least. And he applied them originally to the Torah. Now, this surprises Adventists because most of us are taught that he actually gained his date from Daniel 8.14. But in fact, he didn't gain it from Daniel 8.14. He gained it initially from adding together the Jubilees in the Torah. And he got them to a figure of 2,520 days, which he then turned into years. He then hunted round to find a starting date. And it, you, the logic of it still defies consideration. I, I find it extraordinary that, that, um, that he did this. But in the end, what he did was he came to the text Isaiah 7-8. In Isaiah 7 8, it talks about 65 years being allotted upon Manasseh in their attempt to dislodge Ahaz. And he took that time and then he scouted around again and he got to Second Chronicles, actually, Second Chronicles 33 11, where it talks about Manasseh being taken to Babylon by the Assyrians. And he connected all those three together, despite the fact that they have absolutely nothing to do with each other. And that gave him his starting date, which was 677 BC. And from that date, he calculated forward with tremendous confidence and arrived at 1843. That's what he did. And the result is he then extended. We know that he, he extended Usher's, he extended Usher's um, chronology by 157 years. There's the two 6,000 years, you can extend it by 157 years in order to fit in all the material that he got of a historic nature. He's, he then tells us that he came to Daniel 8.14. Daniel 8.14 was pointed out to him and it was quite late. And of course, he saw this 2,300 evenings and mornings. He applied the year day principle to that. And then he had to look around for a date to start that and he actually picked the wrong date there were three dates he could have picked uh, 538 536 and 445 bc but he didn't he actually picked a date that had absolutely nothing to do with what he was talking about yet again and the result was that he arrived at 1843 so for him there was proof and he tried to do this 15 times and moving around towards towards this particular gate date the one thing that you realize is he ignored isaiah's prophecy about about cyrus completely and he also ignored of quite a few other things as well the result was that he produced a date which failed three times um, march 21st 1843 when that was passed they kept, they pushed it to march 1844 when the 21st of march 1844 passed with nothing eventually he was persuaded by mr snow who had been carrying out um, preaching during the summer that it might be the 22nd of october 1844 when that passed which it did the result was utter disaster and utter disappointment and it's really interesting isn't it it's another failed date 
in a long list calculated from the time when Benjamin Nahawendi thought up this system back in the ninth century. So ultimately, you know, he was following a system which had failed for over a thousand years. That's what he was doing. And, and also, of course, he didn't take any notice because he didn't know about Rabbi Jephthah ben Eli, who a few years after um, Nehawendi said that the whole system was an utter fraud, that it, all it would bring was misery, disappointment and tears. And my goodness, isn't that true? That is all it's actually done. So it was based then on a Yolong tradition, largely full of medieval speculation, which yielded absolutely nothing. And from the look of it, he misread texts, he indulged in unwarranted manipulation of biblical history and contemporary events, some of which completely failed. For example, the prediction over Turkey in 1840. So we started off then with a disaster. And Miller, the, there were things that Miller achieved, believe it or not. He certainly achieved to put, to, to put the millennium in its proper place, um, which was against the, the prevailing view of the time. The prevailing view was that we would have a thousand year peace and then Jesus would come, not that Jesus would come and then there would be a thousand years. Miller did not believe that at all. Miller believed that there was no evidence at all that, <laughs> that we were gonna have a thousand years of peace. You'd only got to look at British, at, at, at history for that to see that problem. And, also, and so he actually was a person who believed that Jesus came then the millennium. So he got that correct. He got the second coming. For the first time in ages, the second coming suddenly started to come to the fore again. Um, as far as I know, during the 18th century, it was almost lost. Um, and uh, there was very little, little activity in there until the late 18th century when millennialism of a sort started to revive itself again. E.P. E. Thompson talks about millennialism and ideas amongst the working class, believe it or not, um, at the, towards, the end, towards the end of the 18th century. Inadvertently, also, he, he, he did stumble on an idea here with, with Daniel 814, and that's that it went a global cleansing of the earth, and it therefore had a, a certain amount of eschatological or last day significance, but he was bogged down with his date, so he couldn't really progress as far as he should have done. And he was also an ecumenist. He brought all these people together and it's into one movement um, to a certain degree. The problem was, again, they fell foul of his date, which led to a lot of problems. People leaving the place, leave people getting depressed, the people almost losing their faith. There's all sorts of things that this psychologically affected lots and lots of people who had thrown all that they had into this date. Um, Potentially, he had the chance, potentially, I say, to bring all these churches together and to examine the apostolic faith. That's what he had. And he failed. And this completely this failed. He broke up. Broke up. And it's interesting, the aftermath of this was that by in 1847, they all met at Albany. It is the rump of the Millerites. And he admitted that he had made a mistake. He died a very disappointed man a few years later, still believing in the nearness of the second coming. And it's interesting because I've seen literature belonging to Millerites dated as late as 18, uh, 1940. Um, they, they dragged on to, to a tremendous alarm, alarm, the Lord is coming. This is in 1940. So they were, still, they were still battling on, as it were, even though they weren't setting any dates anymore. Out of this wreckage of the Millerites, if you could use that word, four groups emerged. Three of them were Sunday keeping, the called First Day Adventists. They were larger. They thought that they would grow. And one of them, the smallest, the fourth one, which was formed in 1846, was the Sabbatarian group. The Sabbatarian group was not expected to last at all. It was that small and that frail in comparison to the others. Eventually, however, it would grow and it would develop. And in 1863, it would become the Seventh-day Adventist Church. However, the next thing we have to look at really is the effects that 1844 had on 
the Sabbatarian group because this we can see just a moment. We can see that there are certain things that they started to do, which the other groups didn't seem to. As far as I know, the Sabbatari group was the only group that started to look at 1844 and come to a different conclusion about it. Um, they believed that something did happen in a, in, on the 22nd of October 1844. The date may have been wrong for the second coming, but something else was had been going on, what they needed to find. And this is what came out eventually of, 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 of Sabbatarian Adventism, where they started to look at something which would become really and truthfully, as far as I can see, the raison d'etre of this whole movement and the raison d'etre of this church. And like Miller, Miller they they had a very narrow, non-textual interpretation of 2,300 evenings and mornings or days. They also had a narrow approach, therefore, to Daniel 8.14. They seem to have connected Daniel 8.14 to Leviticus 16. And they have come to the conclusion that the cleansing of the sanctuary was something that in what went on in the on earth but now something that was going in heaven. So ultimately, you also therefore must have a sanctuary in heaven. And when you read that, that Moses was shown the pattern from which to actually make his sanctuary, they assumed that the sanctuary on earth was exactly the same as one in heaven. In other words, they took what's called a platonic view, the platonic view of the sanctuary. And as a result of all this, um, they removed you know if, if you you they began to build a theology around it which if you could show the date was wrong and also show that everything else was wrong the core eventually of what's known as 19th century adventism and well, what became known as traditional historical heritage adventism would completely collapse because it was solely based on this date and the interpretation they gave it in relationship to the sanctuary in heaven being a copy of the sanctuary in earth. They also came to the conclusion that in 1844, Jesus moved from the, from the holy place to the most holy place. And this was to lead again to another area of thinking that would completely skew the theology that you find in the Bible. Um, and they attempted by all means, when you look at all this, they, they really did as a result, use every trick in the Huni manual of theology in order to just get around it, but also to maintain it. And that's what's happened to this day. So we come to the factors, the factors that actually created this innovation, because that's what it is. It's an innovation. There is the Edson vision while he was crossing a, a cornfield. Um, is actually was written some 30, 40 years later. This idea was there that Edson is supposed to have seen Jesus moving from one apartment to another while he was crossing the, the, the crossing this cornfield. Um, they moved through the fact that the sanctuary, therefore, was an exact copy of heaven, and the high that as the high priest moved into those holy place on the day of atonement so jesus therefore had moved into the money that meant that in 1840 must have been an action in heaven jesus at his ascension was the claim went to the first apartment somewhere between ad 31 and ad 33 the actual date of the crucifixion is always going to be in dispute because all of our, our actual years are six years out at least. On October the 21st, 1844, he moved to the holy place and began the work of final atonement. The atonement has been in continuous work since 1844 and will not be completed until the end, or at least that's how they saw it. Now, Andreas, and in his, the less, his second letter, argued this point that in fact Jesus when he ascended carried on an atonement 
and after 1844 continued an atonement. This idea that Jews are just interceding for us was completely overwhelmed by as far as Andreasen was concerned. And he actually says in his letter, he demands that they accept to continue a continuous atonement. So that means effectively that the cross, when you look at it, does not complete atonement. You could have a complete atonement of the cross and completed atonement in 1844. Even Andreasen realized that. And too, that there was not a complete atonement at the cross for sin. And in fact, if you read Uriah Smith on this issue, Uriah Smith, in one of his books that I actually did read, pointed out that one of the reasons why Jesus did not produce final atonement for sin at the cross is simply because we still and the whole object of the exercise is to get us to a point where we don't sin anymore. So therefore, th therefore, what happened to the cross was, as far as Uriah Smith was concerned, totally inadequate. Um, and and needed there was something else in time must have gone on in order to deal with the sin problem. So you can see that suddenly 1844 has not only got Jesus moving from one apartment to another, you've also got, a, and that impacts upon the fact as to what happened at Golgotha. The other thing is, and that's that it, um, this, this, they would have to wait, this is the other point, and that's that if there was no uh, uh, dealing in the, the cross, then ultimately they would have to wait till 1844, at the end of the 2300 days, before the work of atonement dealing with sin could come about. And this interpretation led to the idea of cleansing the sanctuary and um, blotting out of sin in the same way as they thought that that's what happened on the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was a cleansing of the The high priests went before the Shekinah, put the blood on, the, on, 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 came out. He ended up that he was any blood anywhere that he wasn't doing. The result was that this is where the blotting out of sin. So what happened on earth happened also in heaven, um, as they understood this. The high priest only had access to the most holy place on the Day of Atonement. That's the only time that he has access. And yet, access is spoken of in the New Testament is, is one that we have direct access to the throne of grace as a result of what Jesus did. Um, really, when you look at this, this could not have been achieved under this system and understanding till 1844 possibly have been till 1844. This is again the position that Andreas took because he wrote a book on Hebrews in the light of 1844, which meant he had to virtually change all the tenses of the book in order to get where he wanted. Mm. And then we get to, to, to the fact that they didn't seem to understand Hebrews. So what was happening was this. They were transferring what the apostolic teaching said happened in the first century they were transferring it all to the 19th century. That's what they were doing. Hmm. And the result is that when we come, therefore, to the 22nd of October, 1844, all that the scriptures say happened at the first century and could teach and taught had been done and finished with and transferred to the 19th century. That's, what, that's effectively what happened. And so we have something like this, and if you if you look at this, you realize the extent which the problem of a gap between apostolic Christianity and traditional Adventism started to develop. For example, apostolic teaching, Christ made a final and incomplete atonement for sin at Golgotha in the first century. Traditional Adventist teaching Christ did not make a final and complete atonement for sin at Golgotha. It had to wait till 1844. Okay. Apostolic teaching. At his ascension, Jesus entered heaven itself. He took his seat next to the Father in the first century. Yeah. Traditional Adventist teaching. 
Christ at his ascension entered the heavenly place and remained there till 1844. Mm -hmm. Apostolic teaching. Every believer has the right access to the Father through Christ and inside Christ, by the way, in the first century. Traditionalist teaching makes direct access impossible till 1844. There was, in other words, there is 1,811 years later that we began to have some form of access. And in fact, if you look at the whole thing, we don't even really get access under this system at all. Amen. At all, you know, the, the high priests mostly went in. But in fact, in fact, the whole idea and the claim of he is certainly countered by this teaching. Um, you know, and you're certainly what's claimed in Acts 2 is untrue. For example, Peter says the reason why the Holy Spirit has come is because Christ has been exalted. Well, that doesn't fit in with this particular view of, uh, of the sanctuary, according to 1844. Mm. Apostolic teaching, and this is very important. Apostolic teaching, Christ is of the order of Melchizedek, not they were behaving on scripture um, the, the and that's in Genesis 14 he's the priest king of Salem who Abraham paid tithe to out of the booty that he had achieved by t attacking the, the, the army that had inv invaded the area and he, when he rescued Lot. And it's interesting because it's quite clear that it says in Hebrews that Levi paid the same tithe to Melchizedek. Why? Because Levi was in the body of the seed of Abraham. Therefore, what Abraham did, Levi did. But this was an older and it was a more superior priesthood to Levi. Levi, the priest were not allowed to be kings. King, the king and the priesthood was kept apart in Israel. Whereas, in fact, Melchizedek had them both together. And he certainly didn't do what the Levi, Leviticus priest did when the sanctuary was set up in Israel. He was of a completely different order, of a completely different, different priest, priest, king. They, they failed to see this. They failed to see this, despite the fact it's written there in chapter seven of uh, Hebrews. And, they, and uh, you know, it's very clear that, the, that as high priest, he entered heaven and he took his seat, having made purification for sin. That's Amen. Amen. The, first, the first three verses of Hebrews and understand what they're saying, you virtually got the abstract of the whole book. Um, they missed that, seem to have missed it. An apostolic teaching, Christ is going, doing in heaven what the Levitical high priest did on the Day of Atonement in the earthly sanctuary from 1844. And even if, even when you come around that statement that Ellen White wrote in 1905, in the, on the 19th of April, she wrote that Jesus at his ascension was the most holy place. And you think, oh, we're getting someone here. here. And the next sentence, she starts to talk about him putting aside his robes. Well, no, he didn't put aside his robes. He sat next to the father and took his seat. That's what the apostolic teaching says. Yeah. Um, apostolic teaching again. All who believe in Christ are seen as raised with him, seated with him in uh, the heavenly place. This is Paul, Lakeland and Ephesians, in the first century. This, by implication, if you take the 1844 teaching, this is impossible um, since there's no such access. Even in 1844, there's no really such access either. So ultimately, we have a conflict there. Apostolic teaching, the proof that Jesus had been exalted into heaven and is, in the, is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as I was just saying. And Peter assumes that Jesus has taken his place in heaven as a result of the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. In, the, and in traditional Adventist teaching, although they accepted the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, um, they couldn't quite see how what really what Peter says fits 1844. In fact, there is indeed 
an argument that when he when Peter actually was saying your sins will be forgiven, it all has to wait till 1844. That's how some people have argued this. But that isn't what Peter's saying at all. Peter is telling them to accept Jesus there and then, then their, their sins will be forgiven. Yes. So traditional tra traditional teaching, you know, it starts to again run up against the apostolic teaching. Even by 1848, the early Adventists were in conflict with the apostolic charisma, as it's called, taught in the first century and taught to the Gentiles by the Jerusalem church. So here we have several things here that are in direct conflict as a result of accepting and believing in 1844 with the first century church. The result was, and if that is, you know, that, that other spin-offs came. And if that wasn't bad enough, we now get to a few more problems. For example, on the basis of all this, we end up with a faulty law and sectarian centered eschatology. We end up with a faulty gospel, which is no gospel at all. We end up with a faulty judgment teaching, which we've come to in a minute. We end up with a legalistic rather than grace-centered understanding of salvation. And we effectively, also, we end up with inf infused righteousness. This is something else that was eventually emerged. Infused righteousness, because they knew nothing seemingly about imputed righteousness. One of the things is very clear here. They had no gospel. Even if they were beginning to discover in the 1848 Sabbath conferences certain things that were true, they had no gospel at the end of this. They had no mechanism by which a person would be saved, except the fact that, as we shall find, most of them came from churches and groups also that didn't have the mechanism for salvation. So really, and truthfully, eventually we ended up then with an infused righteousness based on holy character, development based on the moral law and Sabbath keeping. And ultimately, at the end of that, we find eventually we have a false and very serious erroneous Christology at the end that comes as a result of all this. So we come to the investigative judgment. Now, <clears throat> this was not one of the doctrines that were discovered or put down in 1848, but it was apparently started to be taught amongst some of the Millerites. But the teaching itself did not enter the Adventist group till 1857. Um, and it was sent, it was a letter, a letter dated the 1st of January of that year. And it was written by Elon Everett, who was an Adventist pastor. And he outlined the idea in this, in this letter. It was published by James White in the Review and Sabbath Herald, I think it was, it was called in those days. And then a few weeks later, James actually wrote an article on this, supporting it. This eventually was seen by Uriah Smith, as everything was, seemingly. And Uriah Smith took it further. He took the idea further. He said, oh, well, there was an investigative judgment actually on the Day of Atonement um, in, in Leviticus 16. Well, James White looked at Leviticus 16 and decided there was nothing of the sort. But um, Uriah insisted that when... The high priest went before the Ark of the Covenant. They had an investigation to decide who was fit to stay in the camp of, of Israel and who was not. And therefore, judgment was going on all the time. And the fact of the matter is, and that's that James White wrote an article rebutting all this, saying there was no evidence at all from Leviticus 16 that the high priest did anything of the sort. I, I remember reading this um, article at one time. Um, but the investigative judgment, the idea of somebody standing over and actually investigating the lives of the saints, etc., to decide who should and who should not enter heaven, started to become the central theme of, of a judgment inside the Adventist church. Interestingly enough, although it started off in 40, 57, 1857, Alan White did not comment on it till 1883. Mm. Um, but it was in vogue and it was going around and this the idea behind this as far as i can see was that as sins accumulated in the earthly sanctuary and had to be expunged on the day of atonement so since 1844 jesus had begun now a similar work of expunging the sins of the saints 
So effectively, the sins of the saints were defiling the sanctuary in heaven, which now had to be dealt with. The main idea of this teaching was that in 1844, Jesus, remembering the most holy place, now did a work of cleansing. And so we now had, a, had an, and also a work of judgment. So since the cross was not completed for an atonement for sin, this was the moment from 1844 onwards when that was rectified as Jesus made a final atonement going on at the end of which, which would come to the end, end of probation, what's called probation. And ultimately, while he was doing this, he was actually looking at the books. He was looking at the lives of everybody who confessed him to decide whether they were worthy of heaven or not. Um, so every sin, apparently, that was recorded was forgiven, but it wasn't removed from the books. It stayed on the books until it was effectively overcome. Um, and it wasn't removed mm. until two. So you actually didn't know. Yeah, you were sitting there wondering what was going to happen to you because you didn't know what was going to happen to you. You know, this is the, the nearest I can think of this is medieval Christendom, where the where people didn't understand what was going to happen to them either. They were, you know, they absolutely terrified of the judgments of God. And here you've got a situation where we were going back to the Middle Ages. In fact, I tell you that having looked at this, I came to the conclusion that Abraham was better off than anyone living after 1844. And the, the fact of the matter is, and that the, this, this particular doctrine placed the believer in a state of total tension because he had got to, as it were, arrive at a certain point in his sanctification and this is certainly so in Adventist, early Adventist literature until he would reached a certain point before salvation kicked in he then had to get himself into a position where through a certain lifestyle and a certain form of behavior he effectively attempted to get himself sinless at least in a position where he was able to pass this judgment test so he goes through any hoops. If you can psychologically capture anybody in this bubble, they'll go through enormous numbers of hoops in order to effectively attempt to um, to do this. Um, and so effectively, if every confess, un confessed sin, every unconfessed sin, a sin puts you out, anything that you hadn't overcome puts you out. Um, there was Christ investigating, first of all, the dead. Then he moved to the living. So you don't know when he's going to move to you. You know, this is like the Ministry of Information in 1984 and, the, and the, all the rest of it is very Kafkaesque as well. The fact that you just you just didn't know. And ultimately, therefore, the believer doesn't know what's going to happen to him. So, you know, he doesn't even know when he dies, when he comes to death. He has no idea. What God is going to do with him? Has he done enough? Has he confessed enough? Has he, has he overcome enough sins? You know, the record book has to be clean, apparently. Not one blot on it. And so effectively, this, this reinforced the group's legalism. It reinforced the group's way of looking at perfectionism. And although perfectionism was within the Adventist group because it came through Methodism, um, John Wesley, for example, while he knew the gospel, he made his mistake with sanctification. The result is that most Methodists were indeed believed in sanct sanctification. So ultimately, you know, the, she, Ellen White came out of that Methodism. She was marinated in it as a child. So, uh, so it's not surprising that she took the view that she did. The others belong to the Christian connection or they belong to other groups that had a very similar view of things. So it's not surprising that this church became gospelless. It's not surprising that it sort of put the emphasis upon what you do. And it's not surprising when it got round to the idea of an investigative judgment that that reinforced completely everything you do, what you say, everything that you have is down in the record. You've got to somehow get rid of it and get it off the record. And the only way, you know, so the, so the result is that the problem with all this is that none of this above, none of these things tallies with the apostolic faith, nor Jesus' teaching on judgment, especially when it comes to looking at John's gospel, um, which in fact the above completely denies. So 
I may come down to it. Actually, the other thing you can you can I can tell you is this: it is very close to a Roman Catholic teaching. And so you've got to a point where actually the Adventist Church, which absolutely hates Rome, was embracing Tridentine Roman teaching in this. Any Roman Catholic looking at the Adventist Church and seeing this teaching can resonate with it. I know because I had a Catholic, an ex-Catholic priest who was my line manager. And we had a long discussion on justification. And he told me justification comes at the end, not at the beginning. Um, it, 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 when the soul goes off to God, he faces a judgment. And it is an investigative judgment because the book of the life is the, of the poor soul is standing in front of there. And if the life is not correct, then he doesn't see heaven. And since since Catholics teach, certain ultra Catholics teach, as they did in the Middle Ages, only 5% can get to heaven anyway. You can see why medieval man behaved like he did. The result was that the best he could hope for was purgatory. And this is this this belief was there. So actually, the Adventist Church was indulging in a Roman Catholic belief. It was Roman in something which uh, you know it was was not even gospel and not even apostolic, and certainly didn't come from Jesus. Hmm. So we come to the wider implications now of the the heart of eighteen forty four, and this is where these spin offs start. Um, and first of all, of course, I've already touched on some of this, that the, uh, the group initially came from various quasi-Christian groups, as well as Methodism and also Presbyterianism and the Christian connection and the like. Some were Unitarians, that is, they were anti-Trinitarians. Some were Arian beliefs, certainly Ra Smith did. I think to the day he died, he didn't believe that Jesus had a divine nature. And not only that, that there was one point where he actually wrote when they were arguing with this oh in 1890 he actually wrote that jesus does not have the righteous competence to give to you anyway mm. so ultimately ultimately his view of jesus was not one of, uh, of, of of a divine nature who is able to actually impute righteousness to you completely the opposite um and so so ultimately by but certainly by the 1850s onwards they developed a way of thinking, and this is what it did. It denied the complete atonement at the cross. It denied the teaching that sin had been dealt with at the cross. It denied the central teaching of Jesus's ministry in heaven. It denied the teaching that Jesus at his ascension entered heaven itself and took his seat next to the Father, indicating a finished, completed work. It denied that after the, after the ascension, all had access to the throne of grace. It denied that we were in, totally included in Christ's death and resurrection and that we rose with him as our new Adam. It denied that the gospel of imputed righteousness by which a person is declared righteous, vindicated and set free from sin. Indeed, he's not even seen as a sinner. He's not even seen as a, as a sinner because he's inside Christ as a child of God. It denied the gospel then completely. It failed to notice that Jesus was of the order of Melchizedek, not, not Levi. It ignored the erroneous legalistic implications of the sanctuary teaching. It denied the implications of the curtain which had been ripped in two when Jesus died on the cross, indicating a direct way to the access of God. Amen. It denied the biblical understanding of grace because it was moving to meritorious Christianity, not grace. And it made the moral law the basis of divine acceptance of salvation rather than what Christ did. And it also made the moral law and works the yardstick of over for overcoming sin, not an imputed righteousness based on faith and the faith of Christ applied. It also, while it was on, embraced the character perfection to achieve what was required of a sinless station to pass the investigative judgment on one's record, RC teaching, as I put. It taught that sins had to be confessed and overcome if the judgment was to be passed, RC teaching. That's a Roman Catholic teaching. Taught that one sin unconfessed was overcome, denied one eternity. That is also, by the way, a, a Roman Catholic teaching, embracing embrace salvation, resting on one's person's righteousness, thus effectively change the gospel from an external forensic imputed righteousness to an infused righteousness, RT teaching, RC teaching. You'd be surprised how much Roman teaching is in the Adventist church. Mercy, mercy. Mercy. <laughs> 
taught taught after 1844 with Jesus doing the work of cleansing and judgment in the most holy place is essentially to achieve sinless perfection by the moral law to survive salvation by self-merit. Every single false religion is based on self-merit. Yes, and they took the self-merit My Lord. because of this. In essence, they also became Pelagianists because Pelagius taught this. They rejected original sin. They actually had quite an inadequate view of sin developed inside the Adventist group. Um, that sin was something that you did rather than what you are. So they were also following the Pelagian teaching. Now, Pelagius was a 4th century, 4th uh, to 5th century monk. Um, he was, he was a, a Celtic monk who denied original sin and got himself into trouble for doing so and clashed with Augustine of Hippo over the issue. Um, but the investigation, the, the investigative judgment in principle is effectively Roman and Tridentine in teaching. That's what it is. And when it denies, and it completely denies the gospel and grace and faith alone, it denies it. And one of the great mantras of the Reformation was sola scriptura, sola faith, sola grace, sola Christos. Hey, you, you hold those four and you're a Protestant. This is not Protestantism, my friends. They were never a Protestant church holding these views even though they saw themselves as Protestant. Mercy. Mercy. And then we led to the Christology problem. Because if you've got Christ not doing anything, if you, if you, if you actually have Christ not having a complete atonement, the next thing you look at is this. All right. If effectively uh, we have to we have to become perfect. Um, how does Christ make us perfect? Because we have no gospel. And eventually mm. this came to a situation whereby they started to make a division within Christ's nature. Jesus, therefore, in his humanity, was born of sin, but didn't sin. You work that one out. Sin, but effectively, but he still was perfect in his divinity. So what they did was they ended up imputing sin to the God to, to the God man in his humanity. So effectively, Jesus ceased to be our, our, our substitute. He became our example. This is the other thing that, that moved in. And if true, of course, if, if really is true, then Jesus would have been psychologically the most dysfunctional human being on the earth, the face of the earth. Because something that is of sin cannot sit next to something that is righteous and pure. It just cannot be. They got effectively a person here who would have been considering considerable difficulty. Also, Jesus couldn't have talked about being one with the Father. He couldn't have talked about having us one with the Father through him. Through him. It was all very well saying, ah, but he didn't sin. Yes, but you see, the reason why you think like that is simply because you do not accept original sin. And you do not accept that when Adam fell, everybody else fell. And, it's, and that principle exists in the Levi idea that I gave. Levi paid tithe to Melchizedek, but he couldn't have paid tithe to Melchizedek. He was 400 years after Abraham, but he paid tithe inside his body. What Abraham did, Levi did. What Adam did, we did. When Adam sinned, we sinned. When Adam fell, we fell. It's the same principle all the way through. But this, of course, being a Pelagian group, as they were, rejected all that. The result is that now we have a Jesus who effectively shows us how to become sinless by having sin within him, which he overcomes and therefore effectively shows us as a model. Mercy. Wow. You can't find anywhere in the New Testament, except for a very perverse use of Paul. You cannot, you cannot possibly find anything in there where, where Jesus declares himself to be of sin. In fact, at one point he says, can you accuse me of sin? They could never get a handle on him. There he was. He could not stand there and say, before Abraham was, I am. Without effectively this, this, that statement to be true means he has to be exactly where the way in which he was originally made. 
And what it does really here, it not only denies the new Adam teaching, but it also denies something else, which is which, which is, I, I, is really ter terrifying when you come to think of it. It denies the role of the Holy Spirit in the conception of Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not produce sinful people. Mm. Any more than it produced mm. sinful Adam. It does not produce sinful people. Jesus was a conception of the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, therefore, he was, in truth, the Immaculate Conception. Not Mary. He was the Immaculate Conception. He came out of the womb a perfect child, not of sin, even if he did put himself under the, the, the world that we lived in with all, its, all, all that goes on in it and also under, under of course, the, 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 the line of entropy and death. But the fact of the matter is, when you look at this person, he was not of sin. And this is certainly borne out by the fact that the father said, here is my beloved son that I, you know, and, and, and he looked at him. The father was looking through him. If there'd been anything in there that was tainted, we'd have known it was over. And also all the types point to this. The, the, all the sacrifices had to be perfect. The bread, the unleavened bread inside there had no yeast in it because yeast was a symbol of therefore. When Jesus comes as the true bread of life, he is true unleavened man. That is what he's taught in the scriptures. But this group suddenly decided that Jesus wasn't unleavened man. He actually had sin amongst him, and therefore they divided his, his, his humanity from his divinity. And this really is, it's not just, it, 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 it's not just heresy. This borders, if not over the over the edge of border, on blasphemy. It really does. And so ultimately, they really do. And also, the other thing is this. If you can become sinless, and I said this to somebody on Facebook, if you're becoming sinless, then one, the Holy Spirit is leaving you. And the reason the Holy Spirit is leaving you is because you're becoming more and more independent. Because you do, if you can become sinless, then you do not require grace. You do not require Jesus. You do not require what he did at the cross. You do not require justification by faith as understood in Romans and Galatians. You know, in the end, you've made Jesus completely redundant because you have made it. And you can stand there with the law before you, totally exonerated, with God's help. And the question is, why on earth would God help you to become independent and the very thing he set up at the cross? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. An utter nonsense. <laughs> and we make statements regarding himself. You know, we, 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 it really also makes other statements. You go to John 24. John, John 5, verse 24. Jesus says, he who is my word and the one who sent me, he has eternal life. He has passed from death to life now that that statement becomes null and void in this understanding because you know it it's uh, it, it it really does because it, or indeed a lie is not telling the truth how could you become sure of your salvation in jesus christ when you've got to go through a judgment in 1844 <laughs> how can it be done so really you are looking at a church that went completely awry the very center of it is completely a lie. So the conclusion that one can come to from all the above is this. What they taught was a denial of apostolic teaching as found in the New Testament. If 1844 and these new innovations were true, it completely demolished the central thrust of the apostolic faith given to the Gentiles in the first century. The question asked by the Reformation also now became irrelevant. Now, the question asked in the Reformation is, what is the faith that was given to the Gentiles? That's the mantra of the, of, of the Reformation. What is the faith that was given to the Gentiles? Trying to recover it. And the fact is, and that's therefore, this was became completely irrelevant because some of them, like Andreas and Believed, and also Standish and others, that after 1844, we knew moved into a new dispensation. So ultimately, what Jesus taught, what Paul taught, what Luther taught, and all the rest of it was all right for their time, but now we were in a completely different set altogether. 
I heard somebody who came from Heartland on a on video, a young lad. He was he was up at Gaisley preaching, and he said Paul. When Paul said he could, he did not consider himself perfect. That was quite right. Paul lived before 1844, but after all, for 1844, all the rules changed. All the rules changed. And so now we are struggling to become perfect because the last generation has to be perfect. And after 1844, that's what we have. My goodness, it's better all of you to have been born before 1844 and died before 1844 under this, under, under this thinking. As I said to you, Abraham was better off than we are under this thinking. Mercy. So the implications, really and truthfully, the question asked at the Reformation then became null and void. The implications of the above are this, that for 1,811 years, the gospel of salvation the apostles received from Jesus was at best partial and inadequate, or a stopgap measure till 1844, or at worst, totally untrue. Worst of all, it's a complete denial of Christ and all that he did for us on Golgotha. It's the denial of the ground of our salvation as understood by the first century church. It's a denial of faith in Christ and accepting his faith as being put to our account. At best, it's heresy. At worst, it's blasphemy. And the teachings strike. And this is even this is something else I want you to realize. These teachings are not peripheral things. This is not talking about whether having an argument over whether the king queen of the south is Egypt or the king of the north is someone else. These things strike at the very heart of Adventism as a Christian communion. The very credentials of our, our credentials as a Christian church are struck at by this. And this is the real tragic legacy of 1844. Now, I would claim, and I'm going to say this to everybody, and I don't really care who's listening to it, because they've probably already sealed my excommunication order from the GC, if they're listening. If they do, I'll burn it in the middle of Leamington, like Luther did. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of Wittenberg. Still, I want you to list this because, you know, I would claim that traditional heritage Adventism, and that's where my finger is pointing, because I know there are lots of Adventists who actually are quite revolted by this, and they've, they've embraced something else. They have embraced the, the gospel, and I, I meet them all over the place, but they're like, they're, it's in gold amongst the dross, that's the trouble. It's, it's all, all over the place. But I would claim that heritage, that traditional Adventism that embraces these errors is anti-gospel. It is anti-Christ mm. and it's an anti-Christ movement yeah. within the Adventist church mm. and should have no place in a communion calling itself Christian. Mercy, mercy. The only way the communion can be saved is if it dumps this date and it, and all this manufactured theology around it into the bin of history. That's the only way the Adventist church can, in my view, be saved. 1844 was the most poisonous weed in the Adventist garden, contaminating everything that touches it, including sectarian, sectarianism and this law-centered eschatology. Everything. I remember reading Paxton Paxton said this, you know, you, you put the law at the center of your eschatology instead of grace and Jesus. Why should we listen to you? <laughs> and I agree. Why on earth should we listen to you when you put something at the center of your eschatology? That's absolutely false. And then Mercy. you put yourself there as well. Mercy. We need to return, my friends, to the verities of the Reformation mm. and become a truly solar scripture, Christ-centered, spirit-led communion. We need to come back to this. Yes. So we come. So we have a pro another problem. Because this is where we are. At present, we have a complete dichotomy between what the church claims and the reality. For example, 
the Adventist church, as long as I've been in it, as long as I realized I said, claims to be the heir of the Reformation, yet denies the recovered gospel of the Reformation. The Adventist church claims to be a remnant church of prophecy, yet no remnant church of Christ could entertain such teachings, let alone tolerate them being taught inside its sanctuaries. Mm. The Adventist church claims to be sola scriptura, yet it has used and abused Ellen White's writings as a final inspired court of appeal to trump scripture, making that claim null and val invalid when it's done that. And it certainly did that at Glacier View. It doesn't matter what you do. You can look, you look at the document and uncertainly since 1980, uh, if you look at Article 17, now 18 in the fundamentals, this is what it does. It places Ellen White in this particular position. Now, as I've said before, and I said this at my home church, I said, Ellen White wouldn't have signed up to this. James certainly wouldn't have signed up to it. Uriah certainly wouldn't have signed up to it. And neither should we. Mm. Because it isn't true. So this is the other thing. The other thing is this. In doing this, we have created two opposing authorities within the communion, just like Rome does. And the Adventist church claims to be a Protestant church, yet in attitude to its members, its structure, you look at the structure of the Adventist church, it's a Protestantized papacy. Mm -hmm. The structures, it is triumphalist authority, it is indeed papal, and indeed it is a Protestantized Rome, a mere image of the very thing it claims to hate. Mercy. mercy. That's what it's become. Mercy. That's what it's become. And also, the Adventist Church is, is, is a communion that, like Rome, believes in itself, its place in prophecy, and demands a loyalty, which is idolatrous. Ooh. Nobody. Jesus never told us to have faith in churches. He never told us to have faith in anything except him. He when you look at go to Matthew 28 and you look at it, he told people to become his disciples. Yes. They're baptized on the basis of being his disciples. Yes. Then he teaches yes. them all things. But he is at the center of it. Even when you are baptized, you're being baptized into his death and resurrection. And you're yourself are being baptized. You're yourself being baptized into your death and resurrection because you are one with him. The result is, my friends, as far as I can see, the, word, the, the Adventist church in, in certain areas, the Adventist church in the area of, of, of this, this business of, of traditional Adventism is not far from where Rome was in 1517. Mm. Lord, Lord have and we need, seriously, a reformation and corporate repentance by the whole setup and a rethink as to what makes a church. However, I also noticed something else. When you actually look at some of the things inside Adventism, a lot of it's a lot of them is true. They've discovered things inside the Bible which they which which they put down which, which, when they moved along certain things. The main problem was that all the things that they found that were true um, we're all very well, but one, they didn't save you. And secondly, as I've said, there's no gospel in the middle of any of this. And it's interesting because we had six attempts from 1888 right the way through to 1980. We've had six attempts at trying to get this church into a framework that is worthy of being called a Protestant church. And every time it's been defeated, every time people have turned against it, and it's mostly been the members by the way, mostly the members. Mm. We've tried it and, and the the and in fact, you know, that we've taught the members all this stuff. So when they come to a general conference session, since they have the bulk of the votes, this brand of Adventism gains ascendancy because it can vote at a general conference session. They 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 really did, they really did reject the idea of the law in Galatians. They really did get into trouble, re reject imputed righteousness in 1888 and 1890. They really did, they really did got, remove all the people that were involved in the 1919 Bible conference. They were all removed in the 22 conference. 
general conference session session. Again, when we started to get somewhere in the 1950s, they voted in Robert Pearson who put a stop to it. And we started sacking the sacking the theologians. And when we ended up with so we ended up eventually with 1980, and we know what happened in 1980. This church, every attempt that has been called by God to bring this church to order has actually been overwhelmed by this theology and this view, the church's view of itself. So ultimately, ultimately, we, we have a serious problem inside this church. And I may tell you this, having worked with other churches, it isn't much better, by the way. <laughs> I can tell you that now. It, 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 Christendom is in a shocking state when you actually start to look at exactly what people do believe inside their churches. Um, so I put up my last thing here for you. And my last thing here is, is this, is this. This is what I believe the church should have been. And this is what we could have been. And this is what we still could be, but I no doubt the forces against it are very great. Mm. It could have used the time to rediscover the apostolic faith and charisma in its entirety. In the Reformation, they had discovered the entire um, apostolic faith. It had been recovered. It's reckoned it's been recovered by 1563. And ultimately, but it wasn't under one roof. It was spread all over the place. So they could have they could have done that. They could have looked at it and started to bring it together under one roof. It could have been therefore brought, and it could also have taught the true gospel of Christ, found it, allowed a pure living water of salvation to liberate every believer rather than weigh them down. It could have, you know, it could have been a true community that is genuinely Christ-centered and spirit-led. It could have been a community that trusts on Christ and grace alone. It could have been a community of true Sabbatarian churches. Here you've got a, a universal Sabbatarian church. It should have experienced the love of God, the power of God, the rejoicing, celebrating in the finished atonement of salvation while having a sabbatical relationship with the true Lord of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It could have been a church where all know with assurance that they are saved inside Christ Amen. as their new Adam. A community that knows it's already risen with the with inside of Christ already and seated with him next to the Father. You look at Ephesians chapter two, verse six, it tells us all that. Yes. The church where every member, whoever they are, of a wherever they are in their spiritual development on the curve, if you like, everyone knows they're saved at every point in it. Every point in it. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a true con congregation of priests and prophets who study the word for themselves. They become empowered, liberated, so that they deepen their understanding of scripture without denominational limits. One of the things that you find in the document that was sent in the early 1980s 80s from the, the, the council, from the Autumn Council, was a document on pastoral and theological responsibility. Um, and what it said, only the church in session can decide what's true and not true in the light of scripture. Now, I'll tell you, that's Romanism. That's medievalism. Yes. That is not Protestantism. And the other thing is that the church with Christ at the center of its eschatology inform, should inform its understanding of both Daniel and Revelation. Because at the center of Revelation is the argument who is worthy of worship. Yes. And if it brought all this together with what it already has that is true, if it had gone down this route and brought it all together, I actually do believe that the Adventist church potentially could have been the soundest church in Christendom this side of the second coming. Yes, yes. Which means quite simply why it isn't. And I think the reason that it isn't is because the devil, and I'm just said that the devil has specially sought out this church yes. and it has perverted it from yes. within and it knew full well that if ever it caught up with all this mm. it would mm. become something that he didn't want That's right. but if christ called the adventist church up i can tell you he's been very short changed mm. that's the truth of it 
very short changed. We've got to get rid of these evil doctrines and we've got to get rid of this date. Only then can we move forward as a church, which is what the sort of church that our Lord requires and our Lord really set in motion to be. And that brings me to the end of what I have to say. My friends, we need a Lutheran type reformation. That's what we need in the Catholic church, in this church. Amen. 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 Mercy. John, that was a, a powerful, powerful presentation. It's again left me quite speechless and um, filled with a lot of emotions. You know, I the panel members here, we have we have all been reared in Adventism. And we have loved our church and, and family. That's all we have ever known. I think of my mother, my, my grandmother, my, my father who passed away. And I think of so many mm. church members who they don't understand why Arthur and I took the step we did. Even our children don't understand Yes. But when you love Jesus and you begin to see these things that only God can open your eyes to, we, we, we can't do it. Only God can do it. But we who know this, we have to stand firm whether we go alone or not. And yes. it, is a, it is hard to hold up truly that, that the, the blood of Jesus the cross of Jesus, his wonderful atonement, so complete. We sing the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. That's the song I grew up, one of my favorite songs in the Adventist church, but we had no assurance. Amen. We had no assurance. So true. We were trying so hard to behave our way into the kingdom. Mm. And now to experience the joy, the freedom, it, it comes with a lot of emotions of upset, anger, joy, peace. We go through so much emotions. And not only that, we, we, we've seen the history as we presented on Christian Scholars for, Forum of those who went before us, Desmond Ford, who brought that brilliant light like a soldier by himself who was demonized in the church. All this he brought, he was demonized for it. And we grew up with that demonization of this man not knowing him until today. Mm. His precious wife is in this window and I just applaud her for even being here. Yeah. Having been so ridiculed, having the church just turn their backs, but we see that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm so grateful, yeah, man. so That's grateful. It so grateful for what God is, is doing in us and we must press forward regardless. And I just wanna encourage the panel and our team. And at this time, we, we do have some panel questions and discussions that we want to bring before each person here and our panel members as you line up your questions for John. Um, I wanna say and share mine first. It says, I, I wanna say, how did, John, how did the other religious beliefs of the time influence Adventist development, the culture of the time, the Wesleyans, the, the Catholicism? If you could just briefly let us, tell us how those influences helped in the development of Adventism. One of the main problems was they, was they never it looks as if Wesleyan Methodism and the last day perfectionism of Wesleyan Methodism certainly had an influence over the Adventist church. Um, and Ellen this White is something Paxton. What? Ellen, Ellen White was a Methodist. I mean, the, 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 the other problem was this, that that's that they, the, we, we got Rachel Oaks, Oaks. I mean, Sabbatarians started to come into the group basically 
Um, but what I know, anyway, if someone can tell me differently, I'm quite happy um, to hear it. But but uh, that Rachel Oakes, who was a Seventh Day Baptist, um, she she got them if, when they were talking about both about the law. She said, well, if you go to break the law, you should be a Sabbatarian group. That's that's partly what sparked this off. Because the whites, the whites themselves, the, uh, Helen Harmon as she was, and, and James were not very interested in the Sabbath at all. They thought it was stupid, and 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 they couldn't understand uh, Joseph Bates's excitement about this. And yet, and yet, Sabbatarianism emerged very quickly in the Reformation, and it also, and there were several groups, Sabbatarian groups, and in this country, in England, in England, we know that there were dozens of Sabbatarian groups in England throughout the 1600s. Mm. The main problem, the main problem you find is this: this we never seem to be able to associate Sabbath with liberation, with the liberation of, of a Lord who is Savior and and um, and, and Creator. Mm. That is our problem. We've linked we linked it to being, you know, the, the Sabbath was the seal of God, Sunday's the mark of the beast, and etc. The result is is that you've got a real problem, paranoid problem there. And mm. because it because it means that you can't engage really with any other Christian at a proper Christian level because all you all you see them as is Babylon. That's true. And that and that came through as well. That that developed amongst the group. But in fact they were they were circling the wagons. They were the remnant. They were the true they were the true set. And yes. it must be something, I must say this, it must be something that, that I mean, we see this in Britain to some degree, yes. but it's certainly so in America. I, I, yes. the, the, three, the four American churches I was involved with professionally all saw themselves as remnants, all saw themselves as defending, circling the wagons. And everything, and when you read their Sunday school books, it was all to do with lifestyle. It was all to do with preparing yourself for the end of time. And 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 so this isn't just Adventism. This happened to. Mm -hmm. You can see. I could see it in their books as well, in the way in which their their the, even their pastors argued. Mm -hmm. Um. So, you know, the idea of turning around and saying, "Well, look, there's a there's a, a gospel." I asked one friend of mine who went to one Pentecostal church. I said, "Well, have you ever heard of the gospel?" And he said, "No, I've never heard it. Never ever heard of righteousness by faith inside this church. You've been there for years." Mm -hmm. And Thank this was a Pentecostal you. church, not an Adventist church. Thank you, John. So, uh, so I think yeah. that this is a serious problem, not just within Adventism, but right across the board. Yeah. The, you know, the church, the church itself, the early church, it had lost the gospel by the first century, which is why it ended up a church which grew into what it did. Mm. And this is one of the problems. The first thing that had to be discovered in the Reformation was the gospel. Once they'd established the gospel, everything else could fall in place. But they had to establish how are you saved? Wow. And when and it's interesting, I mean, I mean, you know, mm. that irritating, irritating uh, Augustine monk <laughs> who stood up in 1517 and declared the whole system to be one massive fraud. The only reason why he was able to do that successfully was because of the printing press. Yeah. The only reason we're yeah. able to do it is because of the technology. Thank you, John. There are <laughs> a ton more questions coming forward. All right, panel members, please. Dr. Baldwin. Just a statement before I ask my question. Uh, in Galatians, when I listened to John tonight, this evening rather, I was reminded of Paul, Galatians 1 verse 8, 7 and 8. Hmm. Yeah. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach yeah. to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Yeah. As we have said before, I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Contextually, Paul was speaking of the gospel as it was revealed in justification by faith, righteousness by faith, salvation in Christ, yeah. etc. Yeah. And uh, it is important that the Seventh-day Adventist Church takes into consideration because the investigative judgment is 100% opposite, opposing, contradictory yeah. to the gospel of justification by faith. The Adventist church has been preaching it for a long time. I think the sad part of it is that the church's strength is its weakness 
What am I speaking about? God has blessed the Seventh-day Adventist Church with a fabulous educational system. Yes. It has universities all over the world better than just about any other Protestant denomination, and it trains scholars, yes. Bible scholars. And these are the people presently who use the biblical education that they have to do what you mentioned, John, all sorts of Houdini mechanisms to yes. patch up, to all sorts of pretzels, they move, bent in all sorts of shape to redeem and to, you know, shore up this doctrine. I want to appeal to the Adventist scholars who know better, who keep on trying to patch up this doctrine, to let it go in the name of Jesus. Yes, sir. It cannot be resuscitated. It cannot be reformed. Every effort you make to, I mean, I'm amazed at the efforts being put forth to try to justify this ungospeled position. It's a shame. Yes. And Adventist scholars, as you listen to this, I'm going to ask you kindly to be brave. Because why? People in the two-thirds world, third world countries, are suffering. You're causing a lot of suffering and heartache and pain to people. You keep on trying to you know, shore up this doctrine and the lay members and some pastors who think they understand the doctrine, yes, but they, do they not know understand. that they don't understand the doctrine. Yeah. They've been to school, they learn the Greek and the Hebrew and other things and they forget it. And they come and they yeah. play in the playing field without reading the scriptures as they ought. And I want to appeal to them but take another look. Take another look. It cannot be right. It's like a three-legged stool. All you've got to do is to remove one of the legs and the entire thing comes crumbling down. It is wrong. It's in gospel. And I pray that the reformation that you speak about, John, which is very needed, may happen at this time. I have a question, but I'm going to pa pass on it so that others can get in and say what they have to say. It is very sad that this doctrine in this modern day and age is worse than the Middle Age purgatory system of Catholicism continues to be. May God have mercy. Yes, yes, yes. yes. It, 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 is, it is frightening, Clinton, and not only yeah. that, remember that between 19... One in 1966, a committee, a secret committee, looked at all this, right? And they concluded it wasn't biblical. That's what they oh. concluded. It wasn't yeah. biblical. But they said that the only reason it should be going being taught was because it was in great controversy. Exactly. So great controversy effectively overrode rode a group of scholars sitting there reading mm. Greek and Hebrew, who actually yeah. knew that this whole teaching was nonsense. It wasn't at exactly. least it certainly wasn't biblical. And, and, and even the, over the word of God. And l let me say here too, lay members of the Adventist church who will listen to this. You've got to understand that in Adventist scholarship and among ad many Adventist pastors, there is a mantra that is being repeated over and over again. And that is the members are not ready for this yet. That's right. Yes, yes. They That's always right. say yes. oh, the members not ready yes. for that yet. It's going to mash up the church. Yes. yes. Lay yes. members, just remember this. There are tons of things that your pastors and Bible schools are not saying to you when they meet among themselves. What they say is the members are not ready for this yet. I know of which I speak. That says a lot. That says members are not reading and studying and are dependent upon leaders. And they will not tell the membership. 
They are afraid that they will tell the membership oh, that, they may leave that, the church right. or leave their faith. Yeah, that's right. And they and they end up not just leaving the church, but when when there was this mass exodus in the nineteen eighties, <laughs> Syria, serious. A lot of them, a lot of them, they 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 moved. None of them, some of them went to other churches, but a lot of them didn't. And some of them, I mean, I'm meeting I'm meeting people that I I worked with, I, I studied with, who are atheists. Some of them, some of them are Buddhists. Mm -hmm. Some of them, you know, it, if you were brought up in a church that has got at its center a, a legalistic form of religion, it is very easy to move into Buddhism, and yes. it's very easy to move into Islam, yes. and it's very easy to move move into this, in, as religion. It's dead easy they can move like that very because easy. Jesus isn't at the center of their faith anyway. Thank you, John. We have some more it's, questions it's, coming it's, from our panel members before we move. Works orientated yes. system. Yes. I think that um, I think that we have some other questions coming in. Panel members, please. Uh, John. Brian here. Yeah. You 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 did a masterful job in really showing Roman Catholicism within Adventism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How how does that juxtapose against the Adventist teaching regarding Babylon? Well, in a way, it's hilarious <laughs> because you have a church that actually is in Babylon. You 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 have a church that doesn't realize it's in Babylon because it believes believes it's a, it's because it's a Sabbatarian church. Mm -hmm. It therefore can't be in Babylon because it's defined Babylon as all the keepers. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, it doesn't realize that there's the second beast of Revelation is not America. The second beast of Revelation is 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 one is, is the one that feigns the Holy Spirit, and it also and it also it brought it brings in false religion, false philosophy, false teaching. There's five of the seven churches were involved in this. They were, they were all being caught up in it. Well, the Adventist Church is caught up in it. I've said for ages that the Adventist Church is being driven by the second beast of Revelation, and it doesn't realize it because it's convinced itself that it's the, it's the remnant. Because it's convinced itself, it's okay. Because it's convinced itself of all these things and it's a sectarian communion, it's therefore safe. Well, the Jews weren't safe. <laughs> and, they, and it isn't safe. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact of the matter is that when you get down, get down to it, if you're a gospelless church, then you're cut off from Christ. Going back to something that Clinton said here about Galatians, Paul later on actually says that those people that do this are cut off from Christ. Heaven help us, you end up with a church with all this greatness in it, and it is all there, all there, and it's cut off from Christ because it will not accept the gospel of imputed righteousness, and it will not accept either, either original sin. That's the other problem. That's a serious problem because it does not believe. It believes that you can overcome sin yourself with the help of God, but it doesn't realize you're actually, you are, are, you are sin. You actually are, are when, when, when Adam sinned, you sinned. And, and, and th this is one of the problems we met at, um, when we were at Clavendon was the fact that you had a group of people there that said, sin is what you do. Stop doing it and you can become perfect. Um, and we were said, no, sin is what you are. You, you are a walking sin bag. That's what you are. And, 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 and that really is a problem because if you can overcome all sin, you, this is why you can put in, put in this legalism. If you believe that you are a sinner, born a sinner, conceived as a sinner you will look for grace because you realize there's nothing left to you but if you oh. believe that you, you know and it's all part of it's all part of babylon yes Ron. mercy so 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 this 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 theology this innovation as you call it has, has led yeah. to so many other problems with scripture to the extent that the church, yes. without realizing it, or maybe realizing it, are re they are rejecting the power of the Holy Spirit by, by wanting to hold on to this, this doctrine. Yeah, they've, they've, rejecting, they have rejecting Christ's work and rejecting the Holy Spirit. 
they're, they're, they've certainly rejected the spirit's leading from the point of view that they should have by now realized there's so, so much there's been so much argument inside the average church over this and you should ask the question isn't god isn't god trying to tell us something and the and the fact of the matter is that you know we've had six attempts to get some of this straight and on each occasion there has been and it has been crushed the last one of course was with neil wilson i mean neil, neil wilson effectively purged the church he, he tried to purge the church virtually of all the evangelically minded people in it that's really what he was what he was aiming to do and and the and, the, and, neil and that wilson, means effectively those all, you're, who do not know. all you're left with pardon Neil yeah, yes, yes, uh, Esme. What? Neil Wilson, for those of us who do not know, please. All right. When Neil Wilson was the General Conference President at the time when Glacier View took place in 1980, from about 1980, exactly by about 1982 and onwards, between 1982 and 1985, he removed over, I think, over 300 ministers and the like disappeared, including teachers, um, and thousands of people walked out of the church. And, and and it was all over. It was all over this. And the and the fact that you know in Australia, in Australia, as um, um, you know, as, as Harry Ballis said, three generations would walk walked out the church all in one go. Mm. And it was all over, all over this business. You you have to realise that the Adventist Church church, if it's going to be true to itself properly true to itself and true to to what jesus intended cannot go on teaching something that just isn't so it undermines one it's quite right it undermines the gospel it completely it undermines the gospel of faith it undermines the truth it undermines jesus it 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 denies what he is it it almost it's extraordinary that you end up with a church that has actually become completely like this babylon babylon is a place of confusion babylon is a place where jesus is not babylon is a place where god is not not we're supposed to be in jerusalem and jerusalem is the home and the city of faith you know the it, it, revelations about cities it's a tale of two cities it's been yes. called that Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, and what are we doing when we when we look at ourselves it's the reason why why, why um, when, when you think about it and it's it's the re reason why if you know if any any Catholic looked at the Ad Adventist Church, he hasn't got when he looks at the way in which we are, we understand salvation, he he, he wants to it. <laughs> and I'm not surprised that so many preach one authoritative church to another. That's what they've done. They've moved from one authoritative church to another. Except that they're now keeping Sabbath instead of Sunday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, there is a fear. You, you... John, there is a fear in the Adventist Church in believing this this um, this this message and presentation that you have brought, that the sanctuary will be completely done away with. Could you just explain and enlighten us where that is? Because there's a lot of fear about that, and uh, if you could just share. But if you face if if you have based yourself, if you have based your whole uh, reason reason to exist um, on on eighteen forty four and the sanctuary teaching, I, I I remember I remember Carl Falkenberg saying this. Falkenberg was uh, up in Scotland. He, he he visited Scotland and he he was saying, you know, take eighteen forty four away and the sanctuary teaching, and the Adventist Church disappears. Now Falkenberg oh, take away also take away uh, uh, church. Falkenberg, remember when you say names, just quickly mention who they are. Yeah, Falkenberg, Falkenberg was a general president of the team. Thank you. Yeah, Falkenberg was general conference president at the time, and he came and visited Scotland. And he started off one of his sermons, his sermon, I have it on, I, I saw it on on, the, on video at the time, in, in which he, in the 1990s, in, in which he said that, 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 you know, you take away 1844 on the sanctuary teaching and there's no Adventist church. And, and when I was standing in front of these, these, this group in, um, in Watford, I was sitting in front of this group in Watford all day when I was summoned to it um, to account for my views, despite the fact I'm, due to the fact that my minister put me on trial. <laughs> I, 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 you know, they told me that the Adventist Church only exists for its own interpretation of prophecy. Mm -hmm. 
And I almost said to them in that case, it wasn't worth being in, was it? <laughs> because because it, it's 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 amazing the, to the, have the, our whole the, worth tied up in one date. Our whole worth yeah, of piled up in one date. That's right. Where's that, the that, that's the that's the only conclusion I can come to. It's it's in a date. And that's why everything's been done to validate this date. And yeah. everything's been done to remove people who have approved who yeah. don't like to. And, and who have realized this whole thing is based on sand. It's not yeah. based on the rock, it's based on sand. Mm. And it and it and it, it and it, in fact it isn't even on sand, it's on quicksand. Mm. And the and, and it, it and the pillars yeah. Yeah. are not properly centered. So John. Look, in, in defense of Ellen White, yeah, yes, who, who's saying? It, it, she, she did, she did attempt, she did talk about the fact that we needed to be inside Christ. She did talk about this, but the problem is, she never, I don't believe Ellen White ever entirely understood the gospel. Yeah. I think she got there in part, but she yeah. certainly kept thinking in legalistic terms. Very, I, I, I do, I do believe that's that. A very strong, I'm not, I'm not convinced. That's a very strong statement. I'm not convinced that she, she went that far. John, that's a very strong statement. Yeah. The, uh, way back in my yeah. studies, I came to that conclusion. And I remember distinctively, I was pastoring way in, in Jamaica in a rural area. And I went to church one day and an elderly lady said to me, Ellen White, she never totally understood the gospel, you know. She never got it totally. Yeah. A person who you had not a clue would have such an idea. Ellen Lee said that to me. I'll never forget it. Mm. She never totally understood the gospel quite well. John, mm. what is special about the Seventh day Adventist church there? Haha. <laughs> Because Enrique wants to answer. It, it, it's difficult to say, really. It, it, it discovered, it, 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 it recovered a great deal. It, 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 it recovered certain teachings, the second coming, the new earth, the millennium. It discovered the state of the dead. It realized, it, it also discovered the, the, the notion of understanding of resurrection. It understand all this. It, it it discovered those sort of things. No, no. What, what um, do you mean by discover? But, but because weren't Christians in the nineteenth century, eighteenth century, got, uh, teaching yeah, yeah, those right. things just the same? I'm sorry, John. When you say discover, do you really mean it accentuated those doctrines? Yeah. I, I only also, want to discover. Yeah. I would say it accentuated those doctrines at a point in time. And uh, in its accentuation, it never got it right all the time. But I would prefer to couch it as it accentuated those doctrines because all of those things that they brought to the fore, all the Christian bodies were saying them. Well, in the 18th century in Britain, the church had stopped thinking. Wow. In the 18th century in Britain, it become it 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 had just it, it had just become a formalized church, and and the you know it didn't reflect to anybody. The result is the method the the John the Wesley brothers were going around, particularly John Wesley, but John Wesley was trying to stop people from getting drunk, and a few other things. And the 18th century was a time was a very amoral time in some respects, and a very difficult time. It really was. And um, but the the fact of the matter is, and that's that I do think I also think that the timing. Of the of of the Advent movement was very timely because if you go to the 1840s, it was an extremely important decade for totally different reasons. One, in 1844, Darwin was beginning to work on his theory. By 80, by in 1835, you've got the German school suggesting that you can become a Christian without Jesus. Mm. In in the indeed they did. Um, in the um, you, or by 45, 1845, we have Marxists and the Communist Manifesto. If you look, and, and also in 1844, Nietzsche arrived on the scene. He became, but he was born and started to do what he did. If you look at the seeds of the horrors that hit the 20th century, they all come out mostly of the 1840s. 
John, I want to ask. And, you, and, yeah, I want I want to ask a question because you made a, a beautiful presentation, by the way. You made an observation that I think is worthy of consideration for us to perhaps dwell on and drill into a little bit more. And several times during the presentation, you had made the fact that it's not even 1844 that the believer is assured, but at a subsequent time, could, could you kind of expound on that a little bit more? Because you know this idea of 1844 being the relief, the time, it really isn't. There is still further and subsequent work of atonement that has to be uh, completed. Yes, this, this, this is this is Andreas, and um, and and the the reason why he started going on about this in his letters was because he was meeting the opposite idea in questions on doctrine. When Questions on Doctrine was published, 1956, was it, I think, it, it, the, the, the Andreasen, who had been teaching traditional Adventism through the 20s, 30s, and into the 40s, and up into the 50s, suddenly realized that everything that he'd been teaching was now under threat from this book. And, and in there, he did talk about Jesus having it, making intercession. And he'd also talked about the fact that Jesus' nature was sinless. And it also talked about that the atonement at the cross was completed at the cross. Mm. Um, a whole generation were brought up on this. And, and ultimately, if all that's true, then the very thing of having Jesus, Jesus therefore making continuously making atonement after, after all this, and not just interceding, but actually making atonement, and then as, as, as he believed, then ultimately it completely undermines, of course, the claim, the apostolic claim that Jesus died on the cross once and for all mm. and made it made a single atonement for sin. It, 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 it really does undermine the great Christian claim at the center at the center of the apostolic of the first century. That's what it does. I, and, and, it, and there's no way, there's no way which you either either you say either, either you say that the apostolic position is not is is only a stopgap measure. Mm. Either you say that, that in a way they were they weren't they were given an inadequate gospel until we come to 1844, mm. or you have to come to the conclusion that what happened what happened with this and this and this idea of Jesus continuing a atonement afterwards uh, afterwards ultimate ultimately is wrong. We see some and, other and, and this raised, is this... and we do need to get to a whole lot of people. So make your answers yeah. really short, John. Pastor Brenner, you are you you have something more to follow up with, real quick. Yes, yes. I wanted to I wanted to ask the question, uh, since we know and understand that 1844 is not the be all and end all. In fact, we are told from great controversy that unless and until the Sunday law comes to present the final test. Sins cannot be fully blotted out because the church must first endure the test. But the question I have is this, John. Every single day, hundreds if not thousands of godly Christian people go to rest. They, lay, they, they die. How well, in fact will God ever transcend from the judgment of the dead to the living if every single day, hundreds, if not thousands of people are dying, how will that transition ever happen? Uh, it doesn't make sense, does it? There's no such thing, huh? It doesn't make sense. Please help me. And, and, and you, you know... And I, I'm afraid I can't because I need help myself <laughs> with this one. It's something we actually talked about. I think I think we were at um, at, at Kidderminster where one of them was saying this. He said, "On earth, can we move? Did they move for this?" He said, "Do you believe in probation?" And I said, "No, I don't." I said, "I said it's, it's clear. To, it's you know, it, it." I said, "Not not like this at all," because he's because his dad does. And I, I I I was a student with his dad, 
And I said, I said, no. I said, it seems to me that, uh, you know, Jesus will come when he comes. And I, I, I said, we don't know when, when, when he's told us. He's told us very clearly we're not to do this thing. He tells it to us in Acts, Acts 1, chapter, verse 7. He warns against all this. We can't, and really and truthfully, it, just, it, it logically doesn't make it. It yeah. really doesn't. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's one of those questions. How many books the yeah. Lord got to go through? Yeah. In order to find out who's who, I think who's Jill who. wants to come in. Yes, you know? yes, yes. Thank you so much, John. You've been amazing. We're going to open up uh, the panel. God knows. Um, he Jesus tells us he knows who he is. Yes. No, no. We're going to close Jill, off the panel Jill. now, and we're going to have Jill Ford to share a little bit here, and then Doctor uh, oh, Ramos Jill. as well, as we open up their mics. Look. Dr. Ramos put his hand up long before me, so I let him speak. No, 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 you go ahead, Dr. Jill. Um, uh, I wish I was a doctor. <laughs> I've only got a master's. Um, <laughs> I was just going to mention something given to me by a church uh, historian that hasn't been... Am I unmuted? Yes, yes. yes. You, you can hear me. Okay. Uh, that he allowed me to pretty much copy because I'm writing an article and it's something I think that John hasn't mentioned, although, you know, I might have missed it. Um, oh, yeah, gives I've the, been reading, the key, I've been reading it. <laughs> oh, right. The key article that led to the idea of the investigative judgment was written by Owen Crozier. Now, what I'm telling you, which is fairly complicated, and it's very difficult to listen to somebody um, giving fairly complicated ideas. But this is going to be published in the Adventist, I think, in Adventist Encyclopedia. It's not out yet, but it's the article on Crozier. He was a Millerite preacher entitled The Law of Moses. Um, he wrote an article in 1846. And the person who wrote it pointed out that it reveals the original erroneous ideas that grew into Seventh-day Adventist dogma. It includes several points that describe an unorthodox view of the Hebrew sanctuary services, including these unscriptural positions, and uh, you'll recognize them. But anyway, from 1846. One, the cleansing of the sanctuary spoken of in Daniel 8.14 was the sanctuary of the new covenant, not on earth as the Millerites first assumed, but instead the prototype sanctuary in heaven. Two, Crazier yeah. argued that the atonements offered in the Mosaic rituals were two-phased, that the daily atonements granted forgiveness of sins and the yearly day of atonement achieved a final blotting out of the same sins. Now that's not scriptural, but that's what Adventists have believed. Crucial to his argument was his assertion that the sacrificial blood of the daily services ceremonially contaminated the Mosaic sanctuary. So sacrificial blood contaminated the sanctuary. And it's interesting that in the consensus statement, that was one of the things that the scholars agreed was not biblical. But of course, the consensus statement was not used in judging this at all. But the consensus statement actually acknowledged that a lot of these things were not biblical. And the fourth one was about the scapegoat um, and the position that Crozier taught was scripturally unsound. And the main reason he gave this interpretation was as an explanation of why Jesus didn't come back to the earth in 1844. And most Christian commentators disagree with his explanations. So that was just one thing that, you know, this was the basis of the idea of the investigative judgment. So John, would you like to comment? <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. Thank you for that contribution. John? John might be frozen. Yes, he looks like he might be. Looks like he's frozen. 
Yeah, I read that. I read. I read that. Uh, I actually read that because I've been reading what she sent me about Crozier. Yeah. So this is I, this is yeah, going to be a... okay. Go ahead, Jill. This is going to be published in the Adventist Encyclopedia. It's quite interesting that some of the histories that are coming out are not really taking the church's position on what happened at Glacier View. And they are presenting some things which are against Adventist doctrines, but it's all very subtle and people don't exactly. want their names mentioned. Exactly. I was just about to ask you, Jill, is that it is not the first <laughs> that the church is publishing uh, information that contradicted traditional previous doctrines, but it's more than likely, and I don't want to prejudge, but it's more than likely it will present this new information in such a manner that the average member will not see the difference. Obscurantism yeah. more than likely will encircle it, okay. it will present it in a manner and then scoop around and come right back to traditional Adventism. It's more than likely. Mm. That's but, the way they present it. So they're going to present the facts, but at the end of the conclusion, it's a subtle way of doing this. And if you know how to recognize it and how to see it, you can see it all the time. I need to write that book on it. Where the new information is presented, presented in such a manner that it does not cause a paradigm shift. You see, there's one thing to present information, you know. Was another thing to present the information that will cause a paradigm shift. Yes, it's so a I, great it's a great illustration of the simple human nature. Yeah, of people. Uh, so, so, so <laughs> let, I, uh, just I, I wait if this information will rot the boat, will cause any change. Because then present the information, and you will write around. It's like presenting on Revelation chapter 13 and the mark of the beast and the Kairos Philiae and the sort of thing. There's yeah. a particular textbook within Adventism that shows how all sort of those things are for the end of the day. They scoop around, wheel around, and affirm the traditional thing just the same. So the, the, the member will not see the difference and make a paradigm shift. And that is another very, very dishonest, intellectually dishonest attitude of Adventist scholarship. Mm -hmm. They will present information, but they they print too subtle mm -hmm. to save their jobs. Yes. And to, to, it's, it's embarrassing, it's a shame, and I'm putting it out there because I want them to be challenged Amen. because I know they're doing it. I'm what, what spending money for the system to know. So what, the, what do you just, I'll, I'll just I'll just be brief, and I may have said it when I did an interview. I I don't remember, but the new way of presenting the investigative judgment, because after Glacier View, this is to explain to some of the listeners mm -hmm. what you're likely to get nowadays instead yeah. of the Glacier, the great controversy harsh view yeah. mm -hmm. of um, the investigative judgment, which was largely written by Uriah Smith and. J.N. Andrews, but Ellen White, of course, went along with it. But after Glaze, Niels Eric Andreessen did an interview. He was the president of Andrews, a very fine scholar, good friend, uh, certainly wouldn't believe in the investigative judgment like a lot of them don't. Um, he said that in the 10 years of meetings after Glacier View, where the church came up with the Darkholm series, which had all the answers for Des Ford. Yeah. Yeah. He, he made the point that it was largely a defense of the church position. So it wasn't trying to answer Des's problems, although that would be how it was presented to the lay people. Mm -hmm. But he said they did agree that the investigative yeah. judgment and the great controversy was very harsh. So they agreed to soften it. So what they've done now is they've used a phrase that Des used of the pre-advent judgment. Pre-advent judgment. Actually, pre-advent judgment, you immediately think of immediately before the second coming, right. where God makes up his, his decision. Um, and Des believed in that. 
that's now the more favorable term. So the investigative judgment is less mentioned, which does away with the date, but it's a, it's a clever trick. They still believe in the date, but to make it more palatable, yeah. it's yes. a pre-advent judgment. And, yeah. and the vindication um, of God's character. That's right. That that's the other yeah, go side along with, with the last generation theology, which mm -hmm. may be encapsulated by a group, but it really is Adventist theology, don't you think? Yeah. That, you know, Wesleyan sanctification, Perfect. Christ's life in us. You know, so the gospel yeah. for Ellen White was Jesus in us keeping the law. There's a young... And I'm, I'm actually quite favourable to Ellen White, you know, because she's just human. Yes. And she she was living by her whole experience. Yeah. <clears throat> she really had a very rough life, and I think she did great things. But like you, I don't think she ever really understood the gospel. Sometimes she sounds as though she does, mm -hmm. but when you get down to it, yeah. it's, it's end-time perfection. Jesus in you keeping the law. Exactly. So it's really a focus on sanctification, exactly. which she got from Wesley. She got it quite honestly. Exactly. Yeah. You're going to throw out Ellen White. You're going to throw yeah. out Wesley. who was a great and good man who changed England in his time. You know, you could throw out Luther by because of his terrible sayings about the Jews. Um, when, you, when you say that, Jill, it, it sounds like a, a, a woman who honestly was seeking for truth and, and who was writing according to her own understanding to claim the prophetic gift and hearing God's voice and God speaking to you and giving you instructions, then that's a whole different thing. Because yes, it now, is. And it I, is, is I, now I think that she probably had the wrong view <clears throat> of this herself, but I still can't take the position that she had nothing because I'm just reading this book, this Oxford University press book on Ellen Harmon White, and if you haven't read it, I think you should, where the best Adventist scholars and non-Adventist scholars look at Ellen White. And yes. she was an amazing woman. Right. You've got to hold yes. this intention and not, you know, uh, to me, it's yeah, very e easy to be like a lawyer because I've got lawyers in the family and they get an argument and you they get the evidence and you cannot argue against it. Yeah, Joe, and on all honesty, Joe, I, I think, especially with the presentations that have gone forward in the last couple of weeks with, with Tom, I think what people have concluded is that there is such a consortium of interference, Jan Andrews, Uriah Smith, other ghost writers, we don't know who did what, that it's not so much to cast the aspersions toward Ellen White, but that they're, and, and then though, I must admit, uh, if we're gonna be completely honest, we have to say that there was a lot of literary borrowing that was never admitted, was not, uh, and, and, and whoever we want to, you know, lay that on, if it's the white estate or whomever, the issue I think with, with many of us is not whether Ellen White was a good person or bad person. We're not here to determine that. Yeah. The issue is there were, a, there's just a lot of dissonance. There's a lot of, of things that are not right. Yeah. And, and and we have to be we have to be factual. Yeah. We have to be as yeah. painful as it is. Well, I just want to make a statement. And you know, it doesn't matter if you don't agree with me. I don't expect you will. And I'm I'm not I don't have the capacity to change anybody's mind. I'm not like my husband. <clears throat> but I think we have to be careful because we've come from a fundamentalist church. And when you come out and you learn some of the facts and you've got to rethink your view of inspiration, some of these things become bigger than they might be in the big context. That's all I've got to say. I just, you know, I just wrote to Jonathan Butler, who most of you won't know, he's a very fine historian, was an Adventist, I don't think he is anymore. But he wrote 
the first article in here. And I thought it was inspired about Ellen White. I wrote to him and I, I said to him, you've, you've understood a woman's mind and he understands all the problems with her, but there's more to say. That's all, all I've got to say. I, you know, I'm very much for the underdog. I was married to one and I'll go to extraordinary lengths to defend underdogs. <laughs> and, you know, I came into the church as an, a non adventist My minister was a post questions on doctrine man. And he presented the sinless nature of Christ. When I read about it in the 1970s, I was absolutely shocked to find out that a few people in the church <laughs> believed in the sinful nature of Christ. Mm. I was very naive, obviously. And my husband never tried to explain it to me. He just urged me on to write about it. But I didn't have that background. And I look at Des. Now, Des was a child of Ellen White. He knew she copied and all this. He had explanations, but I won't go into that. He said, I wouldn't read anybody who didn't read. And, use, uh, and everybody uses other people. Now you can go into that and that, but he made a des. And so oh. I think that's all right. I'm getting off track. So the, 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 I've said enough. Appreciate and we welcome your me, father, Dr. Baldwin. Yeah, me, 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 may I say Be something? Be fair. Yeah, let, <laughs> may I say something? I mean, listen, Clinton, if you read this book. <laughs> yeah, I know that book. I know that book. Uh, I, I, you know I'm, it, but have you read yeah. it? I haven't gone through much of it yet. Well, I think you but, but, but Let me say something. No, no. No, no, no. I want to say something in defense of Ellen White because I'm going down your path. You see, the issue right now is not so much Ellen White's failures or her strengths. The issue is that we have moved past the time of Ellen White and people are still enforcing Ellen White as somewhat of a final authority. Let me say something which may... Well, I absolutely um, agree with that. Which may and sound, I do think she was wrong on the gospel. Right. Mm. But, but, but let, let me say something that may sound radical and shocking to some of my colleagues. The point is that many of the problems you find in Ellen White, you can find it in the Bible writers as well. Mm. I had the privilege of doing textual criticism in my doctoral work. And Ellen White made mistakes. The Bible writers made mistakes as well, even in their visions. Ellen White made prophecies that did not come true. You can find dozens of prophecies in the Bible that did not come true. And sometimes the Bible writer had to go back and take it back. It's all there in the Bible as well. So I present a balanced view of Ellen White in my understanding, a prophet or prophetess is a person that helps a group to come into a relationship with Jesus at a particular point in history. The methods and the teachings that the individual may use in most cases will not be perfect. However, it will help individuals at that point in history to come into a relationship with God, not a perfect relationship, but a relationship good for their time. The danger comes in when later generations will use the construct of that earlier prophet from earlier generations to impose it on their later experience. Each generation will have to rethink, will have to discover God again for their, for their time. So the problem is not so, so much with Ellen White, despite her problems. Yeah, the geez. problem is that you have a church a hundred and odd years in Ellen White's death, who will continue to present the constructs and the presentations of Ellen White, which was the best for her time as being dogma, as being the benchmark for the church in the 21st century. We are the problem. 
Mm-hmm. Not well, so much in the right. I agree with that. This well, is well, well, her well, weaknesses. Well, so, yeah, I'm happy with that. Yeah, so so th- th- that's, and, and I, what I've said here, I have it in my book. I've written it. Mm-hmm. More, more well, I've than one. Yeah, I've seen okay. that. Good. <laughs> I'm in I'm in defense of that. I I just uh as as stated before when it comes to the gospel itself you can see both sides of a gospel that is not gospel oriented uh which is very legalistic and uh in its in its presentation and you can see and find the exact uh, opposite quotations in the same and so we have this mixture, and this is the very point I was saying, that it would be well for us to stay with the word of God. I have a question. Um, in, in, the, in the Adventist presentation, uh, within evangelistic campaigns, evangelistic crusades, they will identify Babylon. And then there is a specific call to come out of Babylon. Mm. So based on my observation, the the Adventist church has been very good at bringing other Christians out of their denominations into the Adventist faith because it's calling them out of Babylon. After your presentation today, John, recognizing that the teachings of the Adventist church is, as you say, it's idolatrous and it is anti-Christ, anti-gospel. What do you say to people who are in the Adventist church and who believe a lot of what we believe, but will say to you that I am here because I want to help to transform them, or I want to work from within to change the Adventist church. What do you say to those people? Is that a question for John? Or any yes. other panel member could okay. answer, but it was directed. Can we make this a very brief answer because we must get to our audience as well? To get to the audience, yes. My my answer to that is, good luck. That was very brief. That, that was very brief. <laughs> All right, let's ponder on that. You're you're, you're muted, uh, John. John, you're muted. Don't forget Enrique. I, I, I realized in 1991, sitting in front of this, this committee, um, battling it out for five hours, they wouldn't talk to me about the 1844. I sort of went down for doing it. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I realized the church was unreformable. And and it is unreformable. And it it because it because it won't bend where it's supposed to bend. Yeah. And um and really, at the end, at, at the end of the day, the, the people like me are in. We're, we're we're trying to effectively do what Luther attempted. To do. Yeah. John, we've lost you again. It's frozen. It's freezing up. Okay. We, we, we can o- open up. To the yes. I'd like to have Dr. Enrique share a word, crazy. and we're going to get to. Uh, I took the view that I would go on to. John, we're having serious difficulty with yeah, you. Yeah, we from... need to have. Yeah, Enrique. Yes, let's have Enrique, please. Uh, and Enrique. Then we'll get to Dottie Kaim. We see you. You are unmuted. This is several uh, several statements, not not that much question, but uh, uh, so one of them is that uh, uh, the Wesley brothers, uh, the uh, uh, John Wesley and, and Charles Wesley, especially John, uh, he was uh, enamored with uh, Thomas Kempis' uh, uh, book on on uh, sanctification, 
And Thomas Kempis was a, a, a Roman Catholic. So he believed in salvation through sanctification. So that was one of the, the a big problems uh, uh, John Wesley had. He did believe in justification by faith, but his main issue, uh, uh, the, the, the main thing that he brought up to, to, uh, to the Methodist movement was uh, sanctification for today. And if you uh, couldn't get sanctified, you couldn't get saved. Um, another thing but from what, what uh, we heard here is still today, most Protestant churches are mainly moralists and, not, and, and do not believe in, in righteousness by faith. Uh, if, if you're a liberal, then you're a moralist, uh, you're a deist moralist, and if you're not a liberal, then you're a moralist salvationist. But many, many churches have, have lost what righteousness by faith is all about. Um, you were mentioning uh, uh, the spirit of Antichrist in, 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 in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, it, it, it sounds more like, uh, and I hate to say this, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, because, I mean, <laughs> Uh, when when you're against Christ you, you uh, and, and against uh, uh, Jesus being our Savior, that, that was the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They said that uh, he wasn't God, that he wasn't a Savior, uh, but more or less it's about the same uh, uh, when you say that Christ uh, had a sinful nature. Um, about uh, How about the people who have died and ha haven't heard in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and haven't heard uh, about righteousness by faith? Well, uh, part of what I believe in, in, in Revelation is that God will uh, raise everybody from the dead and they will be able to see Christ and they'll be confronted again with Jesus, who is the gospel. Uh, and they'll have a second chance. Um, one thing that, that I heard as well is that many scholars in the Seventh-day Adventist church are afraid of, of, of pointing the, the humongous errors of the presentation of the gospel in the Seventh Day Adventist Church because they are afraid of losing their jobs. One of the things that uh, we should do is to help them see other avenues to find themselves jobs, uh, so they can have uh, money to you know to obtain their freedom from from uh, the General Conference. Uh, to the lay members who are not ready yet of uh, uh, seeing the truth. Well, that's also stated about uh, TV evangelists who have sinned uh, in the continental United States, uh, especially has sinned against uh, uh, old ladies who, uh, because they take their, uh, their social security money, uh, asking them for money. So, so, I mean, the lay people, especially the old ladies are the ones who need to hear what the gospel is all about to be freed from, from uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, mandatory, mandatory 10%. <laughs> well, sometimes they even ask more. I've heard uh, TV evangelists uh, who say, well, put your, uh, put your money in your pocket and whatever you bring out, uh, 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 that's what you're, you're supposed to give me. Now, I heard that when I was 16 and I had a $20 bill and I said, no, back that. Um, <laughs> because that, that was the only thing that I had in my pocket. So I didn't give him any. Uh, I guess I was a, a rebel since the beginning. Um, uh, historical or, or, or traditional Seventh-day Adventist church, they call themselves the their heirs of Luther because uh, they, they are away from the Roman Catholic church, but uh, they, they, there's, they still follow uh, 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 Roman Catholic principles. Um, yes, 1844 is not the reason why the Seventh-day uh, church was raised by God, but first of all, there was no Seventh-day Adventist church in the beginning. It was a movement, like the a Methodist movement, and it was brought up to accentuate, like uh, my dear brother said, uh, to fight against liberalism uh, in the theology of the time that, that brought Darwinism, Marxism, and ultra-preterism that Christ uh, was not gonna come physically again, but he already came to earth in AD 70. Um, yes, uh, 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 um, uh, the gospel that uh, uh, the apostle Paul and Jesus wrought was lost in other churches. And, and the Seventh-day Adventist church had, has had the 
uh, the calling to, to bring up the gospel. And actually, like I've said before, if it wasn't for uh, people who have uh, from the Seventh-day Adventist church, especially after Glacier View, who brought the gospel, not only to the Seventh-day Adventist church, especially to the lay people, but also to other churches, um, very fewer, fewer people would have known what, what the gospel is all about. So there is a reason for 1844, and it was not uh, uh, the, the, the uh, sanctuary movement, but the Seventh-day Adventist movement and the opportunities that, that uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church has had to, to bring the gospel to others. Yes. Not all of them had have accepted it. Well, then there's another reason why. And it's that, and we've heard it before, especially from, uh, from John, because it wanted to bring so many new things and, and going back to, to, to uh, uh, um, many new things, uh, discovered new things uh, from, from the Bible. They've uh, brought back again all the heresies uh, of, the, of the church uh, from the first uh, uh, century to the, uh, uh, till now. Um, and that is, a call. that is a call for us all as Christians yeah. not to repeat those uh, errors again. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing, Doctor. And we're looking forward to your presentation in April, I believe. We're, we're anticipating that. Um, Dr. Ramos has done extensive research on the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and he's going to be sharing quite a bit with us in the coming months. Now I want to address a few hands that I have seen and I believe Doughty Kaim is one of them. Would you unmute yourself, Doughty Kaim, and um, please share your two minute space of question and answer here. Doughty, unmute yourself, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's it's late here, it's around uh, zero to somewhere there. All right, and where is here? What country are you this is, in? This is Zambia, Africa, Zambia. Beautiful, welcome. Yeah, Go thank ahead. you. Uh, thank you very much, John, for that prolific and uh, powerful presentation. Um, we, we praise God for you and uh, God has kept you alive so that we can get the, the information as we're well. growing up. I'm a pastor also but I'm not a doctor. Um, I have, I don't know, I'm, I'm asking Pastor Baldwin, Pastor Arthur Brana and John. Um, there's one thing that uh, you really need to do to us who are coming up. You need to put a distinction and a place where Ellen White should be. Because one of the things that is, um, that held me to accept the gospel of righteousness by faith, the gospel of grace. It is the writings of Ellen White. I didn't know where to go. Like when I read the writings of Ellen White, she could say, the Lord showed me this. The Lord showed me this. I was shown, I was shown. And what she was shown is contrary to what Paul is saying. And what she said that the angel told me is contrary to what uh, the gospel is saying so my 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 problem has been if truly this was shown by god and she was a messenger of the Lord, how can how possible is it that god can turn back to his message first he says something that is contrary to what uh the bible is saying because when you read the, the book great controversy or the 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 holy of all his chapter when you read it, it, she said she was shown. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think we need, we need a proper direction because even when you preach this message to, to, to church members, you tell them the most um, stacking point is whether to believe Ellen White or maybe you are telling them the truth. Yeah. That is the issue. So they were like, oh, should we follow this or should we follow the prophet of God? Which one should we follow? I think we need we need the line where we should where should we fall? Like where is the place? Yeah, yeah. 
Yes. Very good. Good. Um, Dr. Baldwin and then or Pastor Brenner. Dr. Baldwin quickly and then Pastor Brenner could follow up. Okay. Uh, to, to answer your question, in, in this book, The Person of Jesus Cause Obligatory Sabbath, I have a chapter that answers that question head on. Okay. I will just try and give something in brief. First of all, who is a prophet? Jesus is the final voice of God from his time to the second coming. No other prophet can say anything in principle that he has not already said. Therefore, all subsequent prophets are what I call prophetlets, mini prophets making relevant to their time, the timeless message of Jesus. They are making relevant to their time, the timeless message of Jesus. When we look through salvation's history, we see where God takes his people in stages. For example, when God had the children of Israel out of Egypt, he told them or he allowed them to believe some inaccurate theologies. For example, God told them that if a person pluck you in the eye, what should you do? Poke them back in the other eye. God allowed through his prophet to say to them, if your child is disobedient, what must you do with the child? Take the child to the town square and stone the child. That was truth for that point in history. Later on, another prophet came by the name of Jesus. And he said, you have heard that it was said, but I am now saying to you, mm -hmm. all prophets speak for their time and some of their theologists may not necessarily be accurate. We find this in the Bible. We find it throughout history. I can go through the Bible from Genesis Revelation and so you have a ton of things here that I today and no is not accurate. Mm? However, God does not need correct theology to bring people into relationship with him. Not necessarily correct theology in all its details. Yeah. But God take you where you are and use what you have. The problem comes in when a later generation is using the imperfect constructs, the imperfect theology of a previous generation. And that's the problem with Adventism and Ellen White. Ellen White did the best she could for her time and the people then will be saved as it were under that umbrella of the inaccuracies they had then. However, to take their theology and place it now when we have far more light is to try to use a flashlight in the midday sun. It's not going to work, it's gonna be distracting. So that's the case, my brother. Use Ellen, I mean, Ellen White, the best thing to do, the best thing to do is to lay Ellen White aside, learn to read the Bible. Yes. Yeah. And you're okay. You have to. Amen. The people back in Illinois' time need Ellen White. We do not need him now. Yeah. Honestly, for the past few years, I've not been reading much of Ellen White at all. Why? I do not have enough time. Don't you don't have enough time because in order to understand Ellen White properly, you have to know, you have to exegete her. What does that mean? You have to study the history of the 19th century, yeah. then study her writing within that context. But to read Bible, you have to study the history of the ancient Near East and all the archaeological, so much background information. You will not live long enough. Yeah. So the best thing to do, put her aside for the time being, consult her when you have a spare time, and spend your time on the standard, the Bible. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. I, I just want to read two quotations, uh, Pastor to help you out. And you. these are hardly ever spoken of that need some need to be trumpeted. This is taken from Prophets and Kings, page 626, paragraph one. 
The words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be heard from the pulpit. Number one, for, for pastors, she says that the words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be heard from the pulpit. Number two, this day with God, page 355, paragraph two. The Bible and the Bible only is to be our guide. The Bible and the Bible only is to be our guide. I'm not saying this. This is what she has said out of from her own pen. And thirdly, this is taken from fifth volume of the testimonies, page 664. If you had made God's word your study with the desire to reach the Bible standard and attain to Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimonies. Some people think that that gives a default to say, okay, well, let's just continue to lean. What I hear her saying is, let's graduate and come off of, you know, the, the milk and let's continue now since, since that was our fault that we were not leaning to the standard of the scripture, let's go to the scripture. Mm -hmm. yeah. We would not have needed yeah. her. And yeah. so that's the three things that I would add, just to back up what Dr. Baldwin said. Yes, and I just want to quickly add to two quotes as well, because what Dr. Baldwin said, we don't have time to exegete. Let me read two quotes to you after hearing what Pastor Brennan just said. Now listen to this. If you lessen the confidence of God's people in the testimonies he has sent them, you are rebelling against God as certainly as were Korah, Dathan, and Abraham. She goes on to say here, now if there, if there, the testimony she's talking, mm -hmm. messages are not heeded, the Holy Spirit is shut away from the soul. What further means has God in reserve to reach the erring ones and show them their true condition? <laughs> So you just, you just, you just, you just, what I just spelled out was confusion. You just and muddy the water. <laughs> out <laughs> of Babylon. And the water, I know what the gets really is muddy. That's very muddy. You see, how do you? I, I think. How do you reckon the two quotes below? You know, the, the two quotes here. You see what I'm saying? Yes. This is why we don't have time. We need only the word of God, Christ, in our last and only prophet, Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, Christ in sundry times. He came, he used to speak through prophets, but today, he, the, the Son of Man is speaking to us. Ellen White needed son. Jesus as much as we needed Jesus, as much as we need him. She didn't have, she didn't have, the, the spirit of prophecy is the word of God. And so we, no other foundation has been laid. The, the, the ministry of Ellen White, I'm sorry to say, is another foundation. And we don't have time for it now. I've had it all my life. I've got to now learn the word. I've got to learn the gospel like I've never known it before. <laughs> I've learned it's <laughs> We don't have time. Jesus is coming and i got to get in Christ. And I've got to figure out how to get in him because I've been in Ellen White all my life. So, yeah, so we need to make a firm decision. <laughs> and the decision for me personally, i got to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. I get my devotion from the word of God. And it's sweeter when you get that grass fresh from God. No mediator. We don't have a mediator. Jesus is our mediator. Amen. We don't need yep. an entrance to Christ. He you broke know. down that middle wall. It's gone. Yes. Don't get me started. The, the thing is this, and that's, um, yeah, no, the thing is, is this, and that's, that in 1919, at the 1919 Bible conference, and these were men who knew her, um, they made it very clear that she was not an authority in history, the Bible, or health, or anything. They actually made that, and they, were, and they also knew exactly how she was putting these things together, and who was helping her, and who was doing it. That's right. They knew all that in, in, in 1919, and they, and they made it very, very clear that this had been exaggerated beyond belief. And, and also, they, we know there's some evidence in 1915, when she died, that the general conference didn't want to publish any of her books again. 
and the, <laughs> they really, they got to a point where you know they had enough of this and the and Daniels was quite clear when he said you know the whole thing's been very much much um, exaggerated and they also knew that it, that that she didn't hold the the same view about the testimonies by the way in 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 when they talked to her that the membership did so so ultimately there's a lot of problems here and the and they did in fact intend to write a pamphlet to explain to the membership and to try to put in some order in this because the one thing Daniels was terrified of was that we ended up like the more like the mormons and 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 that there you you should see you read through the minutes of the of the three sessions that they had on Ellen White and the, and the cautions are all over the place. We can't go. They, they, they fell foul of the membership in the end. And she and, and you, if you want to trace the 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 sort of elevation of Ellen, really, you start really in the 1920s onwards. And the, the and and the other thing is, she herself at nine, in 1910 when when she kept the last GC session that she came to, she she told them that they got to read the Bible. She told she picked up the Bible and told. Them them this was the book they were supposed to be reading and and so ultimately although we've got all these contrary statements and all the rest of it really her last statement to the church in session was that the bible was supposed to be read <laughs> and the this is the book yes she said let's so you have to the side you know, and 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 that's and that's what we're supposed to do Amen. so why don't you take notice of her and read it <laughs> you, know, you know really all right. Do we have any other questions? It's, it's, uh, Mervyn Bryan, go ahead. You're unmuted. Very quickly, uh, when Ellen White's grandson came and had Sabbath lunch with our family, my father was a minister in the church uh, here in Birmingham in England. Uh, my father asked him the question with regards to the statements when she said that she saw or she was shown. And he said, that it wasn't necessarily that she had been shown by a vision, but that while she was reading or studying or discussing certain topics, it would come to her mind that such and such was so. Mm -hmm. And when she wrote it, she wrote it in a way that um, I was shown the working of the Holy Spirit through my body, through my mind, um, demonstrated to me that it was such and such. Um, another quick point um, with regards to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Bible is full of instances where God used people despite of themselves. And here in England, in the 1970s, at a synod meeting, the Church of England Synod, that's the committee, like the General Conference Committee, okay, for the Church of England, all the bishops were gathered together, and the Seventh-day Adventist minister, Pastor Baildham, actually witnessed to the synod with regards to the state of the dead. And because up until that point in time, they had just accepted it as the Roman Catholic Church, uh, which they came out of. Um, hundreds of years before, uh, they just accepted that and they accepted the state of the dead in the understanding that Pastor Beldum gave to them from scriptures. So here we have an instance of Seventh Adventists being used by God to bring the wonderful truths of the Bible to the many people. Um, also, we had mentioned Rome and Adventism, and uh, John, you really made this so clear. Uh, I mean, I've been speaking to you for years and years and years, and um, tonight's presentation was uh, absolutely amazing. And um, I had um, an instance where I was speaking with a Roman Catholic priest, and he said to me, I don't understand why Seventh day Adventists have this antipathy toward the Roman Catholic Church. After all, the, um, you are, we are alike in so many ways. You have Ellen White, we have Mary. You have your political system, which is based upon our political system. And when you think about it, the Roman Catholic Church and 
many members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church believe that you have to belong to their church to be saved. So um, the, 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 the thing is that one of the things we see in Adventism is that where Roman Catholicism is strong, Adventism has taken off like a bomb. And it is simply because Adventism is a semi-Protestant organization similar to Rome. And it's so similar to Rome in so many instances that um, people find it easy to swap over because all they're doing is changing the day of the week that they're worshiping on. So, thank you so much, Marvin. Uh, thanks for your time. Absolutely, thanks for sharing. <clears throat> Marvin is the cousin of John Rosier. Um, are there any other questions in the Zoom room? Uh, do we see any questions there? on Facebook. Let me run on there and see if there are any questions. Um, otherwise, we will have our announcements and um, close up. So let me just quickly look here. <clears throat> okay, quite a bit of a distance. 7.30. How can someone be SDA and reject? Somebody said, how can someone be an SDA and reject in 1844 at the same time, declaring E.G. White a false prophet and still be an SDA? How can that be? <laughs> this is from <laughs> Facebook. I, I, I do want to entertain at least one question from Facebook so we can let them know we are watching them as well. How can that be? Well, it just depends on your definition of a Seventh-day Adventist. If you believe that the traditional view and understanding of the Seventh-day Adventist must constitute the belief in Ellen White and 1844, then you cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist. However, if you accept the wider and broader definition of a Seventh-day Adventist, which is one who keeps the Sabbath, and not even for legalistic reasons, but if you desire to choose Sabbath as your day of rest, and if you're looking forward to the second coming of Jesus, which is the Advent portion of the title of your fitness. So I, it just I, depends I, on I, your I, I think they probably meant being a member of the church. Yes, yes. Absolutely not, then you, you can't be a part of the institutional uh, understanding and definition of the Seventh-day Adventist church if you do not accept They won't, they won't let you. That's no, the problem. They won't they let you. Right. They will not have you to remain a believe in 1844. No, uh, could I modify that? Yes. They will allow you if you keep quiet. Yes. And play, you're <laughs> going to be a skillful hypocrite. And you'll be okay. You, you know, I no, want just, to say just, something. Just do it in your private councils. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I want to just say, uh, I want to just say something just, uh, you know, uh, Here's what it here's what kind of saddens me. Um, to be honest, I'm the kind of person I don't like to put someone in the spotlight under a bad shadow. But ultimately, what ends up happening when you're trying to defend the gospel truth, ultimately the question of Ellen White comes up. Yeah. yeah. And, that's right. and you 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 can try not to you know try not to denigrate i don't think that's in the spirit of good christian livelihood to do that with anybody um but but here's the the, the challenge the challenge is it always comes back to the, the the conversation always leads to well what do you do with her and the difficulty of that is trying to address it while not trying to be in any way to denigrate her or to, to, to cast a shadow on her, but you're left at times to have to say the truth and that's where it becomes difficulty. If you can become an expert in obscurantism when it comes to explaining her, then you're good to go. I've never been able to master that craft 
in that area. So for maybe for me, I just need to walk away from the conversation when that happens. Mm -hmm. Well, at this time, we're going to thank you so much, Pastor Branner. Thank you all to our panel members for the time you have taken. Uh, we had a rough start. It was really a rough start. But I do want to thank you all for your patience. For those of you in the window, thanks for hanging in there and Facebook as well and YouTube. So at this point, we're going to have our um, uh, announcements of what's happening in the next up and coming weeks with Christian Scholars Forum. Pastor Brian Reed will do that for us now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let me just go ahead and um, share this with you. Thank you for hanging with us, everyone. Um, as Dr. has said, we we had a rough start. It I, I knew it was going to be a very powerful presentation today. And I knew that the wickedness in high places would have been trying to to halt what was going to be going out today. But we we thank you for sticking with us. Um, coming up on March. Six, which is two weeks from now, we should be having Dr. Chris Toffel. And then uh, right, right now we are doing two presentations per month. We started off doing presentations every week. Right now we're doing, uh, doing them every, every two weeks, twice per month. Uh, we do have a group uh, who might want to meet with us for some other presentations. If that materializes, we may have some presentations in between, but we will let you know uh, by way of email or by Facebook, uh, we will let you know. But as of now, this is our lineup, March 6th, Dr. Christoffel. March 20th, we have Dr. Baldwin. April 3rd, we have Dr. Milton Hook. And then April 17th, we have Dr. Enrique Ramos, who is... Um, going to be giving us also a powerful presentation. As usual, if you have any questions or need additional information, please send us an email at christianscholarsforum at gmail.com. The YouTubes are available, uh, the, I'm sorry, the videos of our presentations are available on YouTube. Uh, you can go to Christian Scholars Forum for that, and you can also find them on Science of Salvation you'll be able to find the videos there. I, I hope this one is not too bad. There, was, uh, there were a lot of breakups in between, but hopefully it will be um, good enough for, for you to go back and, and look at it again. If not, we will have to redo the presentation just so we can get it clear to you again. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so as, as we know, our presentations are sponsored by Christian Scholars Forum, Opinions SDA, uh, Science of Salvation, Eden Home Ministries, and Dikayoma Ministries. Two of those ministries are actually do meet for worship services every Saturday. And uh, this one is led by Dr. Clinton Baldwin, Dikayoma, Dikayoma Ministries International. And they meet every Saturday uh, at 10.30 a.m. Eastern and Jamaica time, that's 9.30 a.m. Central time. And then we both have, we, we have joint um, prayer meetings. We call it Kingdom Petition Time on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. So we look forward to having you. They are he headquartered in Spanish Town, 66A Brunswick Avenue, Spanish Town, Jamaica. Dr. Baldwin is the senior pastor with his associate, Pastor Moses Marsh. Check them out sometime. And then Eden Home Ministries, we are located here in Atlanta, Georgia at 3300 Buckeye Road. Of course, all our services are virtual right now, but the leaders are myself, Pastor Reed, and Pastor Arthur Branner II. Uh, just want to flash you these resources that we have. I have some books that you can check out to help you in your understanding of some of the issues that have been presented and then a full understanding of the gospel. If you need any 
resources or you know have any questions about resources do send us an email christian scholars forum.org we thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to having you for our next presentation god bless you and just want to remind you that we talk to you about cognitive dissonance and how to manage it i want to also uh just share with you that we join you in your process because we too experience our own share of cognitive dissonance we 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 are we do our best to manage it in a christ-like manner mm -hmm. and to make sure that we do not lose our hold on christ christ we have made him the center of all that we do so we are able to still manage our own cognitive dissonance none of us is exempt from it but i trust that we all will handle it gracefully through the presence of the holy spirit thank you so much God. thank you pastor brian you you are such an amazing help to all of us on the panel you provide the powerpoints and i don't know how you do so many things at once but we applaud you and thank you so much for your hard work behind the scenes I um, just want to share, you know, Arthur Bowman is one of our regulars and I just want to acknowledge him. He's 75 years old and 13 months ago, because he loves Jesus, because he has decided to follow Christ and let go of every earthly support, he resigned his membership from the Seventh-day Adventist church. And he did that because he believes in the gospel and could no longer be a hypocrite and continue to hold on to doctrines that were not based in the word of God. And I think that's a testimony. That's a testimony. Leaving the Seventh-day Adventist church is not leaving Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, and Amen. it's not leaving the Seventh-day Adventist church. It is leaving the doctrines of error is, is what we're talking about. Amen. My church family will always be my church family, and we will always love one another. I will always love you. I have left the doctrines of error for the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, and we really need to recognize that. Thank you, Arthur, for your statement and your testimony tonight. We love you. Keep visiting with us. And at this time, we would like Dr. Baldwin to close with us now these remarks of this meeting here and um we will we will close in prayer shortly after that by mervin thank you doctor i will make it brief the hour is late just want to remind you all of us the words of jesus in john 8 32 mm -hmm. you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you real good. Thank you all, everyone who joined us once again. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. This is Christian Scholars Forum, where our mantra is to find the truth, expand your mind. Our mission is to advance truth, expand the mind and encourage hearts through research, education, and the creation of new path. And our vision to be the premier forum for the presentation of biblical truth. May God bless you real good. Please come again and join us. Have a good evening, everyone. Amen. I'd like to invite Mervyn Bryan to do our closing prayer. A kind eternal Father in heaven, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the research that John has done and for the work your Holy Spirit has done in clearing the picture so that he could share it with us. We pray for all those, dear Heavenly Father, who listened to the lecture and asked that we are all blessed by this historic presentation. We acknowledge that your Holy Spirit is with us and will help us to gain a blessing and a personal closeness to you, O oh God. We ask that your blessings on all those blessed 
involved in bringing Jesus by scholarly means closer to you will continue. We ask that those in authority inside the denomination shall be led by you and the work of the Holy Spirit to put aside their political goals and have their hearts melted with the love of Jesus and knowledge and accept the errors of 1844 and present the truths to the people in their care. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you will continue to be with all those involved in Christian Scholars Forum, that you will help us to overcome the attacks of the devil, as has been prevalent in the breaking down of computers and of equi other equipment, and even the breaking down of the electronic message that was given to us tonight. We acknowledge that you have helped us through these difficulties, and we thank you for all that. And we ask, dear Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit will hover over us and protect us and guide us in our thought patterns and understandings so that people can, can experience the joy of the gospel of Jesus and the freedom that that brings. These yeah. things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Have a great night. Join us, if you wish, in the Zoom room for about 10 minutes for a little private chit-chat as we go off <clears throat> the air from Facebook. Goodbye, Facebook family. God bless. <laughs>